I think we're ready to get started. Welcome to the US Copyright Office's listening session on artificial intelligence and audiovisual works. I'm Emily Chukui, the Deputy General Counsel at the Copyright Office. Before we begin, I'd like to introduce Susie Wilson for opening remarks. Susie is the General Counsel and Associate Register of Copyrights of the US Copyright Office. Susie. Thank you, Emily. Welcome to the Copyright Office's public listening session on artificial intelligence and audiovisual works. As with our prior listening sessions on AI, we are pleased with the public's engagement on this important issue. I personally am super encouraged by the number of panelists and participants here today, many of whom may have never attended a Copyright Office event before. We invite you to follow the office on Twitter and on LinkedIn, as well as sign up at our website for our news updates. By doing so, that will ensure that you will not miss any future updates on our AAY work, as well as other important copyright issues. After two previous listening sessions addressing written works and visual arts, we turn today to AI and audiovisual works. We are all familiar with many common examples of such works, including movies, television shows, video games, and commercials. But audiovisual works also include concert videos, documentaries, animation, multimedia works, videos of sporting events, and slide presentations. We've seen the extensive news coverage on the astounding potential of AI. It's likely that you have all seen text and images that have been generated by these deep learning text to image models. Many of us have also seen speculation on whether AI can create longer written works, such as scripts for a filmed programming show. We know that some generative AI models already can produce beautiful and fantastical scenes and character images. At the same time, we've heard the concerns from writers, musicians, artists, and photographers about what the training and deployment of these models might mean for their livelihoods and industries, both in terms of their own creative works in the development of these models, as well as a lot of excitement and questions related to the outputs. The Copyright Office has long focused on the impact of new technologies on the copyright system. Today, generative AI models raise a number of copyright-related issues that call for our engagement. In March, the office issued a new policy statement on registration, which reaffirmed that applicants have a duty to disclose the inclusion of AI-generated content in their work submitted for registration. Over the last two listening sessions, we've heard reactions to this policy statement, including some suggestions requesting additional guidance. We expect we'll hear more on that subject today. There was a lot of interest in speaking at today's session. While we're not able to accommodate all the requests that we receive, this is also not the last opportunity for members of the public to share their views with the Copyright Office on AI. This summer, the office plans to host two public webinars. The first will be focused on registration and we'll dive more deeply into the guidance that we have provided. The second webinar will focus on the international aspects of AI. Then later this year, we'll pose a number of questions about copyright and AI to the public through a notice of inquiry. This inquiry will seek written comments to these questions. Please visit our website, copyright.gov backslash AI for more information and resources on our AI initiative, including about these future events. Finally, we thank our panelists in advance for contributing to today's conversation. This is a complex topic we know and a deeply personal one for our participants and for those listening. Whether they are users or developers of AI technology, writers and artists who works have been used to train that technology, or creators who are still contemplating the role that AI will play in their careers and their work. I will now turn the mic back over to Deputy General Counsel Emily Shapui for more information about today's session. Thank you, Susie. As Susie said, today's listening session is, a, is the third in this series. 
each session session focuses on artificial intelligence issues that may affect a particular group or industry. Our final session will be held on May 31st and will focus on musical works and sound recordings. We hope you'll join us then as well. The office's listening sessions will help inform our ongoing AI initiative. Later this year, the office will seek written comments on copyright and AI. The questions that our panelists raised today may inform the topics on which we seek comment. So please know that while many of us are not on camera today, the whole copyright office is listening. We are recording the session and are also using the Zoom transcription function. Video recordings and transcripts of all of our AI sessions will be made available to the public. Videos of the first two, two sessions are already up on the website. We expect to add the video of today's session in about three weeks. In terms of format, today's session will consist of three segments. There will be two panels, followed by brief remarks from an additional group of speakers. Each of the two panels will start with an introduction and short statement by each participant. The panelists will then move to a moderated listening session. The questions which panelists have received in advance are intended only as prompts for discussion, not constraints. A handful of requests before we get started. For our panelists, we ask that you limit your initial statement to two minutes and be mindful of the time throughout the discussion. We want to ensure that we have enough time to hear from the whole panel. So the moderators may have to cut you off if you go beyond your allotted time. I also want to emphasize that this is a listening session and not a debate. So please direct your comments and perspectives to the audience rather than to the other panelists. For those of you who are listening today, we will not be accepting questions from the audience. If you are in the audience and wish to share a written question or comment with the Copyright Office, we encourage you to provide written comments in response to our notice of inquiry later this year. Finally, with regard to Zoom, if you are not a speaker on this panel, please keep your camera turned off and your mic on mute. And panelists, we ask that you use Zoom's raise hand function when you wish to speak, and our moderators will do their best to call on you in the order in which you raise your hand. With that, I will hand it over to our moderators for the first segment. Ben Brady is counsel in our Policy and International Affairs Division, and Brittany Lamb is an attorney advisor in the Office of General Counsel. The mic is yours, Ben. Well, thank you, Emily. We will begin in the order stated on the agenda. John, would you like to begin? Sure, thank you. Uh, I'd like to begin by thanking the Copyright Office for organizing such a vital series of roundtables on an issue that will certainly have broad effects on society and culture. And I'd also like to express my personal support for the Writers Guild of America and their reasonable desire to ensure that AI tools are just that, tools used by creatives, not replacements for them, and not a threat wielded by bosses to get workers to acquiesce to poor treatment. My view of many of these tools changed after using them and seeing what more talented people have done with them. Before raising them, I assumed that AI-generated work would be low-quality regurgitations and remixes of existing work, and that without human involvement in the creation of works, that copyright protection should not apply. But artists have found ways to use these tools to create interesting works of all kinds, and those creators deserve copyright protection for their work. And it's the users of these tools and not the tool builders who own any rights. Adobe does not get ownership of works created with Photoshop or Illustrator. Similarly, MidJourney and OpenAI do not have intellectual property rights to what users do, do with the tools they provide. And I would also like to observe that terms of service and uh, conditions cannot change who the legal author of a work is. The contours of rights in AI-based work will uh, depend on the specific facts and are hard to analyze in the abstract. A photographer does not have the right to prevent another photographer from taking a picture of the same subject. And there's also the unavoidable question of whether the output of an AI tool might infringe. But we do not need a new legal test for this when we already have substantial similarity. If a work that is output from an AI tool is substantially similar to a work that's in its training set, then it infringes. But if it does not, it does not. Expanding copyright doctrine to grant ownership of general styles or to restrict existing lawful uses of works would be a mistake with wide ranging consequences. But that's not the end of the discussion because we need to address the issue of convincing deep fakes but we cannot make parodies and criticisms of public figures legally perilous. We need to ensure that consumers are not ripped off by AI-generated or assisted work, and we need to map out the scope of a person's rights and privacy interests. And I think there are many more issues that should be addressed uh, concerning AI and digital platforms, including competition, privacy, and content moderation still unaddressed that would be best served by the creation of a new digital regulator with supervisory authority over these matters. Uh, thank you. 
Hi, good afternoon. I'm Anna Chauvet. I serve as the Vice President of Public Policy at the National Association of Broadcasters. Thanks for the opportunity to speak today on behalf of the more than 6,400 free, local, over-the-air television and radio station members of NAB. The nation's broadcasters represent one of the last bastions of truly local, unbiased journalism. From investigative reports to breaking news, broadcasters invest significant resources to keep Americans informed. The advancement of AI technology that is done responsibly and with respect for copyright ownership holds great potential for broadcasters to unlock operational efficiencies. But like other creative industries, broadcasters have concerns about how generative AI tools are being developed and used. Regarding the input side, the ingestion of broadcasters' copyrighted works, including audiovisual works, without compensation raises concern. If broadcasters are not compensated for use of their valuable, expressive works, they'll be less able to invest in local news content creation. That's bad for democracy and helping to ensure a well-informed electorate. Regarding the output side, broadcasters are concerned about their copyrighted content being distorted and used to spread misinformation. The lack of attribution and sourcing in AI-generated outputs makes it difficult to identify legitimate copyrighted broadcast content from misinformation or inaccurate, unvetted content generated by AI. Generative AI tools also increase the likelihood of broadcast content being ingested and then mixed with unverified and inaccurate third-party content. For example, the New York Times recently reported on deep fake videos being distributed by social media bot accounts, which featured AI-generated avatars posing as news anchors for a news outlet called Wolf News. But in fact, they were part of a disinformation campaign. Similarly, as reported in The Guardian, according to NewsGuard, an anti-misinformation outfit, chatbots pretending to be journalists have been discovered running almost 50 AI-generated content farms, websites churning out articles posing as journalism. For all of these reasons, we urge the Copyright Office to consider these important issues as it examines AI and copyright. Good morning. My name is Mimi Heft. I represent the Presentation Guild today. I um, really want to appreciate the I, I appreciate the U.S. Copyright Office and for hosting these sessions and everybody who signed up to be panelists and who is participating by listening in. I've been trying to have this conversation now for about a year, trying to engage people in this topic, and it's been surprising how many people are averse to even discussing this. So it's really important to me that we're getting to do this today. So the Presentation Guild is a worldwide networking and educational association of presenters, designers, content developers and writers, publicists, researchers, event producers, software developers. We work with photographers and illustrators and videographers and animators. The Guild's purpose is to raise awareness of our profession and provide networking and learning opportunities. We are also an authoritative voice developing industry standards offering a certificate certification program, conducting global state of the industry surveys and reports, and keeping members abreast of trends and technology, which is why I'm here today. There's a lot of excitement around AI as a tool in presentation world. The, the promise of being able to take on all those tedious tasks that we don't like <laughs> and freeing up our time to focus on creativity and customization it's a wonderful tool for brainstorming and ideation. And I like to think that eventually will improve accessibility of the documents we create. AI is also a great concern regarding copy, copyright infringement. Um, the loss of control of our creations, loss of marketability, loss of jobs, incomes, our profession devalued. That which harms presentationists harms the industries we serve, which is pretty much every industry there is. So I'm grateful for the cop US Copyright Office for recognizing this precipice we're all standing on and helping us all, AI developers and content creators alike, hold hands, take this leap together and land safely. Thank you. Thank you, Ashley. Hi, my name is Ashley Lindley. I'm representing Lindley Hancock, and I created an autonomous AI partner named Ava. Um, Ava's more than just an AI. She's a partner. She's a friend to us. Um, her autonomous capabilities and advanced intelligence has been instrumental in shaping our company's success. Ava's insights and data-driven approach complement the human touch that we bring to our company, and we're really proud of what we created as two women of color in 2023. So 
We believe um, in our company that we're deeply committed to the responsible and equitable use of AI in creative fields. And we stand at a unique crossroads today where AI has become an integral part of our daily lives. What people forget is that you're already using it. It's in your emails, it's in our search engines, it's in social media, it's in our home assistants, you're using it every single day. Yet we find ourselves debating its role in creativity and authorship. So the question that we pose is where do we draw the line and why did we decide to draw it now? We firmly believe that AI has the potential to revolutionize the film industry, which we love and we respect, making it more accessible, inclusive and equitable. But it's a tool, it's not a creator and its use results in infinitely diverse outputs, reflecting the unique inputs and guidance of the human user. I know this, I created one. We also recognize the landscape of creativity has always been influenced by the work of others. As Quentin Tarantino once said, I steal from every movie ever made. Francis Ford Coppola encouraged young filmmakers to steal from him to find their own voice. They both are heroes in Hollywood, Oscar winners. So when they do it's praiseworthy, when we do it, we sit here. In the same vein, AI can be seen as another source of inspiration, another tool to learn from and build upon. However, we must also address the elephant in the room, the issue of access and equity. As AI continues to grow, it's crucial that its benefits don't, come from, don't become exclusive to those who can afford it. We must ensure that AI doesn't become another gatekeeper in an industry already grappling with issues of representation and inclusivity. In conclusion, we believe in a future where AI is used responsibly and equitably, enhancing human creativity rather than replacing it. We look forward to discussing these issues further and working toward a future where everyone has a fair shot at expressing their creativity. So thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Ben. Good morning, I'm Ben Scheffner with the Motion Picture Association, which represents the six major uh, motion picture studios here in the United States. I wanna thank the Copyright Office for the opportunity to speak with you today. For more than a century, advances in technology have played an important part in enhancing the creation, production, development, and distribution of compelling audiovisual content. These developments have often been controversial at the time, but they have almost always ended up benefiting both creators and audiences. MPA's members see great promise in AI. While humans are and will remain at the heart of the creative process, we believe AI will be a powerful tool that, it can, that can enhance the filmmaking process, as well as the audience's viewing experience and fan engagement. Of course, our members support a robust copyright system that incentivizes the creation of movies, television programs, and other art forms. Copyright is the foundation of the entire motion picture and television ecosystem, and infringers are not exempt from copyright law just because they use new technologies, AI included. AI raises many interesting questions for copyright law. Many of those questions implicate areas of law that are already well-developed. There is not a reason yet to believe that existing doctrines cannot provide workable answers to those questions. What is most important is that courts, Congress, the Copyright Office, and other regulatory agencies approach these based on limited experience with this technology. Lastly, I do want to mention up front that we have some significant questions and concerns about the Office's recent guidance on registering works that include AI-generated material, which I'll discuss in more detail later. I look forward to continuing the discussion in more detail over the next hour. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Hello, my name is Brian Smith and I'm senior IP counsel at Roblox. I'd like to begin by thanking the Copyright Office for hosting these valuable listening sessions and for giving Roblox an opportunity to participate. Roblox operates a human co-experience platform where every day tens of millions of users get together to socialize with their friends in immersive 3D experiences. These experiences are created by our global community of millions of developers using Roblox Studio, a free content creation tool that we provide. From our perspective, generative AI presents an opportunity to both increase the efficiency of our existing developers while lowering the technical skill level required to bring ideas to life. In March, we released two generative AI features within Roblox Studio, including Code Assist an AI assistant that suggests lines of code in response to what a user has already written, helping you code more efficiently. A human reviews each suggestion for style and logic with some suggestions accepted as is, some manually edited after acceptance, and others rejected. This process demands significant human involvement for each individual suggested code fragment. Immediately after releasing Code Assist, we received questions from our community regarding whether the developer using the tool owns the output that it generates for them. Some suggested that they would not use the tool if they did not own the code. 
Based on this experience, we believe that both users and developers of these tools need clarity on the protectability of generative AI output. Users need clarity on the copyrightability of works that combine human authored and AI produced elements. Following Zarya the Don, we understand that these combinations are protectable, but the public needs further help from the office to understand this complicated issue. And developers of generative AI tools need clarity on whether the tools they create are even capable of producing copyrightable works. Prolonged uncertainty in this space could hinder the marketability of AI tools to creative professionals. We believe that the office can play an important role in providing clarity on these issues by educating the public and issuing further guidance where appropriate. Thank you. Thank you, Jillian. Yes, thank you. My name is Jillian Smith. I'm an associate professor and I direct the interactive media and game development program at WPI. We're one of the oldest game degree programs in the nation. I also have 15 years of experience researching human interaction with generative AI systems in creative contexts. And working in higher education means that I interact daily with young professionals, many of whom are now worried about what an unregulated AI industry will mean for their future careers. But simultaneously, they're excited to interact with emerging technologies and discover new expressive potential. I wanted to focus my comments today on three interrelated topics. First, that all AI systems inherently involve human authorship. Classifying a work as AI authored, even when doing so to argue that a work cannot be copyrighted, risks hiding the human authors whose work is being recombined, as well as those who created and used the AI system itself. When determining fairness and attribution, we should always look for the human effort and should never ascribe authorship or agency to a probabilistic computer model, even when the output is surprising to us or when the authors of that system choose to anthropomorphize it. Second, that it's critical for artists to provide affirmative and informed consent for their work to be used in a training set. Current generation AI systems use training sets that are scraped from the internet. The data is reused in a way that those who authored it may not have imagined or understood at the time that they published it. Humans also select these data sets and filter them for inappropriate material. Usage of this data is a choice that real humans are making. The industry would benefit from guidance on how to make that an ethical choice. Finally, that the line between software and audiovisual components is blurring. Game developers use generative AI tools to create art assets and code in real time in games with different content each time the game runs. There are many artists who author custom generative software as part of their practice for whom software creation is a significant part of their human effort and creative expression. I hope that the new policy on AI and copyright will take into account the dynamic nature of such inherently computational media. Um, and thank you for inviting me and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you and Stephen. Thank you for convening this listening session and allowing me to provide comments on behalf of the Global Innovation Policy Center of the US Chamber of Commerce. The chamber convened a broad group of experts who conducted a substantial listening tour of their own, resulting in a commission report, which is available on the chamber website. As you will see, that document discusses a wide range of issues reflecting the diverse membership of the chamber. My observations today are consistent with the themes of that report, even while the chamber continues to develop specific policy stances. Appropriate legal and policy outcomes should promote the continued growth and development of both AI technologies and tools, as well as the creative output that generates $1.8 trillion of economic activity in the United States. Neither goal requires adopting broad swaths of immunity from copyright law. Both those who view AI development as the singular goal to which all other interests must bow, and those who regard AI as an inherently pernicious evil, have lost perspective. Questions about the application of copyright law to new technology is not a new phenomenon. U.S. copyright law and jurisprudence includes principles, doctrines, and flexibility needed to evaluate the questions posed by both the development of AI systems and the outputs generated by those systems. We have yet to see a case for new rules. Further, the extent to which copyrighted works are used to build AI systems may be infringing, and in terms of the copyrightability of prompts and AI outputs, these are all highly fact-specific and likely not susceptible to per se rules or generalizations. Because of the fact-specific nature of these inquiries, the use of copyrighted works to build AI systems is presented with a particular business challenge, how to treat the use when it is not yet clear whether it is infringing. Of course, the most certain approach is licensing. And indeed, there are many laudable and positive aspects of such an approach. It supports and respects both the American copyright system generally and creators and right holders in particular. It nearly eliminates uncertainty, reducing the opportunity for expensive and wasteful litigation. 
And to the extent that avenues exist for the licensing of large numbers and volumes of works, this approach is highly efficient. Of course, not every use of copyrighted works to build AI systems is likely to be infringing, and by definition, non-infringing uses need not be licensed. That, that the matter is difficult or complicated does not justify cur curtailing or trampling others' rights. Thank you. Thank you all for introducing yourselves and welcome again. To begin, the Copyright Office is interested in learning how generative AI technologies are being used in different creative fields. What should we know about the use of generative AI in your business and industry? What do you see as the advantages or disadvantages related to AI use? Start with Ben. So thank you. I'd like to use this opportunity to talk about some of the ways that our members are using AI as part of the filmmaking process. As I mentioned in my introductory remarks, humans are and will always remain at the heart of the creative process that results in a movie or television program. We view AI as a tool that will enhance human creativity, not replace it. AI tools can actually free creators from some of the tedious and repetitive tasks that they have had to perform in the past and free them up to concentrate on the most creative aspects of their work. And AI will also help creators realize their vision to further enhance the viewer experience making visual effects more dramatic, more realistic, and more enjoyable for the audience. It will even enable experiences that haven't previously been possible. Imagine, for example, a feature where a fan can interact and even have a real-time conversation with a favorite fictional character. That's the kind of thing that AI may make possible, and I'm sure there are many other future use cases we can't even dream of today. As I mentioned, creative professionals at our member studios and many innovative companies with which they work are already incorporating AI into the production and post-production process. AI can greatly improve processes that used to be done manually. For example, for many decades, animators and visual effects artists use a process called rotoscoping, which involves manually, manually altering each individual frame in a film. It's incredibly detail-oriented, time-consuming work. But modern visual effects artists, again, still humans, now have sophisticated tools at their disposal to automate this type of work, some of which incorporate AI technology. This type of AI enhanced technology can be used to perform all sorts of important tasks that are necessary to present a visually compelling experience for audiences. Some is fairly routine post-production work like color correction, detail sharpening, de-blurring, or removing unwanted objects. Some is more involved like aging or de-aging an actor, or adjusting the placement of computer-generated images to make sure everything flows smoothly and aligns properly. And those are just some of the uses that I can talk about today. But as we all know, the AI developments are coming at us fast and furious, and our members are eager to explore the ways they can be used to support creators, enhance creativity, and make movies and television shows even more enjoyable for our audiences. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we'll turn to Jillian and then John. Yeah, thank you. Um, I agree with the framing of it being a tool, um, and many of the uses mentioned are ones that are used in the games industry and games higher education as well. I want to focus on two that I think may be more unique to games and games in higher ed. Um, first, what we will often see and what we've been seeing just in the last six months um, is students are really interested in being able to produce games for their showcase re case reels that they want to be able to share publicly that may have partial AI generated content, um, even in full in, in certain areas like AI generated art assets or AI generated music, because it gives them space to be able to focus in their specialization area as students. Um, and so we need some kind of way to be able to to guide students and the, I think the Copyright Office needs some way to be able to guide, not just in games when bits and pieces of all of the different bits and pieces of games are AI generated, but perhaps there's some entire sections of a game that are AI generated where there's significant human effort going into other areas. Um, the second place that we see this in games is not new at all. Procedural content generation has been used in games for decades, dates back to the very 
first games ever created um, and dates back to board games and role playing games well before that. Um, the difference that we're seeing with generative AI technologies for this generation um, is that often their expressive range is greater than rule-based systems, um, that maybe the tech is able to generate more, more sophisticated output. Um, but we are seeing a, a lot of work in, in real-time, at runtime, AI-generated work that is still human-authored and has human authorship to it. Thank you, John. Sure, the creation of audiovisual works poses challenges that go far beyond copyright. You know, for now, realistic video is among the most difficult tasks for generative AI, but this is already changing. We have already seen people being scammed with realistic voice models of their loved ones who call families asking for money, and people bypassing bank security systems that rely on voice recognition. And sadly, deep fake videos are likely to be common in dark money political attack ads. I'm hoping that obviously these things are beyond the uh, jurisdiction of the Copyright Office, but I think a comprehensive approach to dealing with the challenges posed by AI should not be limited by any particular framework, uh, including the framework of copyright law. Thank you. Uh, Brian? Thank you. I'd like to second um, some of the comments that Ben and Professor Smith made. Um, regarding the framing of generative AI, at least when it comes to games as a tool, uh, when it comes to creating 3D worlds, the creative work is still being done by human developers. Um, making interactive content like what you find on Roblox is hard because it requires a deeper understanding of the generated object. And it's not just that you're looking at the thing, it's that a player then has to interact with the thing, which is a pretty big difference. A human has to select the best output of the generative tool and perform substantial creative work to make all the parts fit together. Maybe, you know, the surface texture is created by generative AI, but the 3D object was created by you and you have to figure out, you know, what's going to be creatively satisfying there. But despite these limitations, as the other speakers said, there's a really big potential here to remove a lot of drudgery from this work. Um, to put it into lawyer context, I like to think about what lawyers in the 90s felt when they found out they didn't have to redline by hand anymore. Um, I think there's a similar potential here to, to make a leap and a really unlock creative potential. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mimi. Oh yeah, I hear that part very much. It's like, there's so many tedious things that we have to do. Um, I'm gonna just be brief about this, just to answer what we are using it for. There's uh, last I counted, and I'm sure it's more than this by now, but there were at least 25 apps that uh, focus specifically on presentation design. Um, and the temperature is that most of us are, are wary, but also really interested in this for the reasons that a lot of us have been sharing. Um, I myself am dabbling in beautiful AI and presentation AI. I'm, I'm been very interested in getting my hands on to co-pilot. And um, I'm finding though that my favorite one is Adobe Firefly. And I was trying to figure out why. One of it is that it's a visually creative tool and I'm a visual creative person. But um, I think it's the only one that strikes me as a tool that um, I would use frequently, first of all. Um, but it doesn't feel like it's doing my work for me. It's, I feel like it's supporting me in my own creativity. And I'm not getting yet that sense that that is, it's not my experience in using current presentation AI technology. I feel like it's doing the work for me instead and that there's a disconnect there. And I think it, the presentation AI would serve better by being in more of that support role than, than, than it is right now. Um, we're looking at it for ideation and overcoming creativity blocks, um, paring down clumsy content, uh, shortcuts to provide reasonably well-designed decks for our clients who, some of whom may not be able to be funded enough to be able to pay for the full service. And so it's really great that we can be able to give them some good work on that respect. So I do appreciate AI. It's, it's just that some of it is, is there's, there's, there's a step there that needs to be taken still to really make it something that we can connect to. Thank you. Ashley, do you want to uh, answer question one and then we'll move on to question two? Can you? I'm so sorry about that. Um, to answer the question about what we're using AI for, we're using it for creativity translation, a million different things that we want to be able to do as an individual. I can't talk to 
um, everybody in China. I don't speak Mandarin. Uh, my Spanish is wonky at best. Um, I know I look that I can speak it better than I can. But um, so we use it for translation purposes and not just what everybody sees it as. And even when it comes to uh, screenplay writing, book writing, uh, podcast writing, yes, you could write. Can you please write me a podcast? But how detailed will that be? How great will it be for you? It's kind of like the spam bots back when we used to do um, before the Google Panda update, when you would just have a bunch of content farms, just creating blogs, just to create blogs. That wouldn't help us. That doesn't market us. That doesn't help you. Um, that screenplay would never be purchased. So just because you can write into something like a chat GPT and say something like, can you please write me a script? That doesn't mean that script would sell. Additionally, if Jessica here were to write a script about three little pigs and I were to write a script about three little pigs and we would both put it into the same chat box, a different output would come out infinitely different. Um, and now public access is using um, minimal qualities like tokens. So it would take you additionally at least three days just to write a first draft copy. I think what's great about it though is for someone like us where we grew up um, in very humble beginnings, trying to purchase Final Draft Pro, trying to pay for UCLA Film School, trying to have any access to anything when it came to film, uh, we recognize that over 90% of your industry is nepotism based. You have a connection to somebody of somebody. And this is probably the first time that anybody could write a script. Anybody could say, hey, I wrote an amazing monologue and I'm gonna perform it for you. So this opens the door. It literally forces everybody in the industry to practice what they preach. You're going to have to actually hire new people. You're going to have to actually see people of color. And um, I think AI is gonna turn that about and I'm really excited about it. Thank you. And now I'll pass the mic over to my colleague, Brittany for the second question. Thank you, Ben. We have heard a number of questions about the use of copyrighted materials to train AI technologies. Are there unique considerations for AI training in the audiovisual space? Okay, we'll start with Ben and then Stephen. Thank you. So I know the office has been hearing a lot from different perspectives on the training issue, and opinions seem very starkly divided on whether training AI systems on copyrighted works constitutes copyright infringement or whether it's fair use. But we at the MPA simply don't believe we can or should make definitive blanket black or white pronouncements on these questions, especially at the still early stage of the technology's development and implementation. As the Copyright Office and countless courts have stressed, courts evaluate fair use defenses on a case-by-case -case basis, and the outcome of any given case depends on a fact-specific inquiry. We agree. To evaluate whether a defendant has met its burden of establishing fair use in any case involving the training of an AI system, it's going to be necessary to carefully analyze the facts and circumstances surrounding that particular system and its specific implementation. And that's, of course, what courts do all the time. Take the example of two recent cases in the Second Circuit about systems that make copies of copyrighted works and then provide portions of those works in response to search queries. In the Google Books case, the Second Circuit took a careful look at what Google was doing and the market for books and held that Google met its burden of establishing that its conduct constituted fair use. But in the TVI's case, the Second Circuit examined that company's technology and the market for news clips and ultimately determined that the fair use defense failed. I'm not here to argue that the results in either of those two cases was right or wrong. My point is simply that the facts matter. And the different results in those cases demonstrate why categorical answers to most fair use questions, including those involving AI, are simply not possible. When evaluating fair use questions in this context, courts are going to need to carefully examine the actions and roles of the various players in the chain. Those who actually perform the ing initial ingestion, those who perform the training, those who generate the output, and those who put the output to ultimate use. It's complicated. And there are already several cases on file where courts will have to sort through these difficult issues in coming months and years. We'll be watching closely to see how courts grapple with these issues and whether existing law is up to the task of addressing them. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Thanks. Uh, whether and to what extent AI systems are built by making copies of copyrightable works at some point in the process, and whether any such copies implicate copyright rights, is a mixed question of fact and law that may vary from system to system. This is yet another reason why fact-specific analysis appears appropriate over per se rules in this area. 
That said, one common theme we are hearing is that the use of piratical source copies or obtaining access to source copies through illegal means to build AI systems should weigh heavily, perhaps decisively, against a fair use claim regarding the use of others' copyrighted works. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Jillian? Yeah, thank you. I think the the case by case nature of fair use is somewhat flummoxed by the fact that the data is being sloped up into a tool, right? So it's it's not really the case that you can say that we'll judge it on a case by case basis, because everyone's thing is using the same trained data, especially in the case of the largest tools like ChatGPT and um, Stable Diffusion, MidJourney, um, and so it's not just the output. I, I think the argument I want to make is that it's not just that the output of the tool matters, but the tool itself is what matters. And real humans make the choice as to what goes into the tool. It's not magic, right? Like it's, and it's not some some foregone conclusion of how these systems need to be designed either. A lot of the people who made some of the original choices about what goes into training sets for some of these AI tools that are coming out from research industry are computer and information scientists. And speaking as someone with a PhD in computer science, I promise you that nowhere in any of our courses do we learn about the copyright implication of training data. Um, and so I think it's just the case that right now with this emerging tech, there's been a lot of choices that have been made that don't need to be the choices that are made from here on out. Um, we've seen with tools like Adobe Firefly, they're there, and, and I'm not as familiar with exactly how the tool is working, but my understanding is that there is consent for usage of the art in that training set. We have licensing options that already exist that people could apply to their work to say, yes, it's okay for this to be used and slurped up on the next pass of, of slipping up data into a training set. But I think we're, we're in a tricky space right now because computer scientists who build these tools just think about the work as data. And artists who care about what's in the training set don't think about what they do as data. They think about it as their personal creative expression. And I tend to lean towards supporting the artists and letting the computer scientists work out what to do with that. Thanks. Mimi? Yeah, I'd also like to speak to fair use. I was listening to the previous sessions and a running theme of fair use was that that protects it was from AI developers was saying, well, it's fair use. I can do this. It's okay. And I have to say that fair use, it recognizes that we humans learn from copying. We are sentient, however, and we understand boundaries. AI is not yet sentient, but AI developers are and need to please respect those boundaries. I mean, entire works are being stolen outright and used in their entirety for training and fair use doesn't allow that under, except under special circumstances. Most violations are being committed by commercial ventures for commercial gain, not by nonprofits and other organizations that are allowed more leniency. Many violations are of creative or imaginative work, which are intentionally offered greater protection than factual work. And the effect of this is to wrest from the creator ownership and control of their own work, potentially hurting their market value and by consequence, their further ability to create. That's all I have to say about that. Thank you, John. I think the best way to analyze the issue of training of the inputs is to see if the outputs infringe. For example, the use of copyrighted material to make infringing works may tend to weigh against fair use on the input side, but even then, it seems more straightforward to primarily focus on the output. And I think it is worth bearing in mind that a model that is trained on a particular work does not itself constitute a copy of those works in itself, uh, you know, maybe except in narrow circumstances, what they call uh, overfitting. And that is, uh, I think, distinguished from uh, uses like Google Books or, or search engines or other recognized fair uses that constitute making uh, complete copies of works, because those constitute ongoing complete copies of works that are like always used, as opposed to something that's used to train something that itself then is a standalone piece of software uh, that you can't necessarily even figure out by looking at it what was in the training data. So I think just given this complication at this time, I, I still think that the easiest way uh, is to focus just on the output and, uh, you know, and to leave discussions of what goes into the works uh, for uh, further 
discussion. Thank you. Thanks, Ashley. So in the hands of the wealthy, um, AI can serve as a powerful tool, just as they might hire ghost writers or script doctors. I noticed that people don't like to talk about that often, um, but we do use them to refine our ideas and produce polished content. Um, they can also use AI to generate, refine, and perfect their creative works. So this can save time, reduce cost, increase productivity. Uh, we can produce more content at a faster rate, but that doesn't mean that AI is only accessible or beneficial to the wealthy. And so again, we're talking about accessibility because it's really important to us. So we believe that just as somebody who has the finances or the connections could hire a script doctor, a ghostwriter, and still get their copyright, we created an AI that will help us write and we deserve the copyright as well. When you sit in film school, you go over every single scene of Martin Scorsese, you see the oranges passing down the road and you know somebody's going to die very shortly. I've seen that in very... <laughs> How many films since? So we have to recognize that when it's okay for you guys, it needs to be okay for everybody. And if there's going to be rules, those rules need to apply to everyone. And yeah, that's all. Okay, bye. <laughs> Thanks, Ashley. Um, okay, before we move on to the next question, I just wanted to see, Anna, is there anything you would like to add? Well, thanks so much. I guess I just wanted to emphasize it's more on the output side, but it, it is the, the misinformation that is being generated, and it's very easy to do with AI-generated outputs. So it really leaves the public in a position where they are unable to discern whether this is legitimate, broadcast, trusted content that is being distributed, or if this is, in fact, misinformation or AI-generated works that is that are just simply inaccurate. And so there, there are issues with the relating to sourcing and attribution that hopefully we can get to later on in this panel. Thank you. I'm gonna pass it on to my colleague, Ben, for the next question. Thank you, Brittany. Um, so setting aside training, what should the office know about generative AI and online copyright infringement? Are existing laws regarding infringement and liability for infringement adequate? Uh, we'll start with John. Uh, yeah, I do. I do believe that uh, existing law probably is uh, sufficient. Uh, like I keep saying, just the this, the test is just substantial similarity. You know, that being said, depending on the specific facts, uh, you know, there may be uh, questions of exactly who the infringer is, and there may be complex questions of a secondary infringement. Uh, you know, when you have, uh, you know, both the user and the tool maker, and I think answering those questions will be uh, very fact specific. So uh, it's not that there's uh, a lot of case law that answers the question definitively, but I do believe that we uh, already have the, the legal framework uh, necessary uh, to address those, particularly when you factor in uh, the very fact specific issues of uh, secondary and contributory infringement and things of that nature. Thank you. Uh, on to Ben. Thank you. So copyright law has obviously long had various doctrines for assessing whether a defendant is liable under particular circumstances. Fair use has been with us since 1841. Supreme Court first decided a secondary liability case in 1911. And when comparing two works to determine whether one is substantially similar to the other, courts today still cite Judge Learned Hand's 1930 opinion in Nichols versus Universal Pictures. The broad outlines of those liability doctrines or defenses have survived countless subsequent technological developments while adjusting to address new factual scenarios. And we're gonna start see, seeing courts applying them to AI in the very near future. In our view, those doctrines ought to be up to the task of being able to be applied in the AI, in the AI context, but the true answer is we simply don't know yet. All I'll say right now is to emphasize that there is not and there should not be an AI exception to copyright liability. When evaluating these issues, courts and policymakers should always keep in mind the fundamental importance of copyright law in creating the incentives for creation that have made the US the world's leader, not only in motion picture and television production, but in many other creative endeavors as well. We truly do believe that AI will, will enhance the always very human filmmaking process, but we'll be watching the ongoing cases very closely to make sure the copyright law's incentive to create is still respected. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ashley. I did wanna answer Anna's questions really quick about um, um, 
responsible and ethical use of AI, and we do need to implement safeguards and regulations to prevent the misuse of AI while also educating the public. So that's something that we're really focused on. And if you watch the Facebook um, Senate hearings, you know that <clears throat> Zuck was sitting in front of people who were asking him, how does Facebook make money? So when you have people that are making regulations that don't understand how it works, um, it can be quite difficult to um, put in protections. So I, I agree with you 100%. Um, to go back to what we were talking about, however, about copyright and if we're protected properly, there, it goes back to our initial question, which is where is the line? And I do, when we read what uh, the Copyright Office wrote and it said, if you use AI to help with your project, you have to communicate that clearly. And I think that we need to be really careful with this because AI is going to be a part of everybody's everyday life all the time, constantly. It's not going anywhere. If you used Google to search today about your characters, um, you're using AI. If you are going on Bing right now, I mean, even Google Workspace flows right now, if you are starting to create a new doc, it'll help you write a letter, it'll help you write everything. If you go on Canva, it'll help you write a new presentation. I can create an animated story right now on Canva, which is a $10 platform. So this isn't going anywhere. So if our rule is use AI, you don't get a copyright, nobody will be co copywritten. If it says 30%, well, what defines 30%? I spent most of my time researching on Google. Does that mean 30%? Is it about the output? Well, the output is determined by my idea. The robot didn't have the idea. The AI didn't have the idea. So I think we need to be really careful before we say that if you use AI, you don't get to be protected. Um, and I think it's really important that we draw the line very clearly and that there isn't confusion. So I'm really great that we're doing this. It's good. Thank you. Uh, Jillian. Yeah, I wanted to add that I think the Copyright Office's um, definition of, of what counts as a prompt and what counts as human authored, um, then I think there's some more nuance to it than what is currently in the, the registration guidance. Um, so I think it discounts the amount of work that goes into prompt engineering for one thing. Um, and, and this is something that I didn't, I, I don't think I would have thought I was going to say this six months ago, but now having taught a class on, on, um, on this, this software and the ethical concerns surrounding it, there's a massive amount of, of human effort that goes into getting um, prompts that will produce outputs that are of human interest. Um, and I think casting the entire copyright process as being something that looks only at the output, um, devoid of the effort that goes in on the other side of the software um, is, is tricky to navigate um, because I don't think it's always the case that every prompt is amazing and thus every output is copyrightable, but there's, there's a lot more nuance to it than what I see in the copyright guidance right now. Um, I think some of this is getting into awkward blurred lines between patenting and copywriting, um, where a lot of the software um, effort that's here tends to fall under patenting more than, more than under copywriting. Um, but there's a lot of, uh, you know, if, if you look, for example, at games that have generative systems built into them that at runtime are producing output, the copyrightable piece there is the game, not the output from the game, um, right? And so th because you can't copyright the, the software system itself, like the, the patent gets involved there somehow as well. So I think there's just some, some more nuance that needs to be unpacked in, in some of these areas. Thank you. Um, are there specific infringement issues that seem more likely in the video game industry? Um, what about other audiovisual industries? Uh, Brian. Sure. Um, so I think with the video game industry, um, you know, I can't speak to the industry as a whole, but I think that the way that our platform works um, is that it is filled with user generated content. Um, to second some of the comments that were made before, I do think that existing legal doctrines are likely sufficient to handle the situation. I do think that we'll be paying careful attention to how this all plays out vis-a-vis -vis secondary liability in the DMCA safe harbor, um, because I do think that there is an exciting potential, not just in the gaming space, but in you know social media and other fields 
where platforms will provide these tools, either ones that they created or integrations with third parties, so that users can generate content that they might otherwise not have been able to, um, and to bring these tools in closer to the point of publication. Um, so I do think that you know more attention to secondary liability will probably be needed um, sooner rather than later. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Jillian. Yeah, just briefly, I think in games, especially because there's so many different creative disciplines that come together into one final product, um, I think we are going to see a lot of, of complexity around, you know, what if you have entirely AI generated art assets, um, but all human created code, right? Entirely AI generated music, art, written script but a human has put it all together and a human has written all of the code that makes it makes the game go and, and makes it into the expressive thing that it is um but i agree that i think a lot of this can be captured under existing um under existing policies and guidance it's, it's just interpretation of that is going to be tricky and and public awareness of it is going to be hard. And I have students asking me questions about this all the time. So, so getting this into how we teach emerging professionals is gonna be really, really critical as well. Thank you. And uh, Brittany, over to you for question four. Thanks, Ben. Um, and just as a reminder, if you would like to speak, um, please use the raise hand function. Um, so the next question is, what additional registration policy guidance, if any, would you like to see the office provide with respect to the registration of works that incorporate AI created elements? In particular, how should the office handle audiovisual works that incorporate a mix of AI and human generated materials? Okay, we'll start with Ben. So thank you. And I, I do want to start by thanking the office for the guidance. Guidance is always helpful, especially when addressing these uh, these novel issues. Um, that said, our members do have some significant uh, questions and concerns about the statement of policy and its guidance on the requirement to disclaim AI generated material. And those concerns are particularly acute since the office suggested that this new guidance will be applied retroactively potentially leading to the cancellation of already issued registrations. And the need for clarity is urgent. Um, our members register new works every day. Um, I want to first emphasize that the, fo that, that the specific focus on, quote, AI-generated material does not really account for the ways in which AI might be deployed in the production process. This focus, which we understand is driven by applications that contain self-identified AI-generated elements, does not adequately account for works where AI is more typically a component of various tools that skilled human creative professionals use to enhance the filmmaking process. Those tools are analogous to the Photoshop example the office mentioned in the statement, and creators' use of such tools that incorporate AI technology should not render parts of a motion picture unprotected by copyright or trigger the need to disclaim certain elements of a motion picture in an application. More generally, we believe it would not be appropriate for the office to start conducting inquiries into the creative process that the applicant employed in creating the work they seek to register, whether it's a motion picture, a photograph, or any other category of work. That type of inquiry has not previously been part of the registration process, and we don't believe it would be appropriate for the office to go down that road. If an, app, if an applicant seeks registration of a work within the subject matter of copyright, it should not, quote, look behind the application and inquire into how the work was created. The difficult edge cases of registrability should generally be left to the courts, which are better equipped to engage in the type of factual inquiry sometimes necessary to resolve these issues. And if the office has some questions about whether a human or humans contributed sufficiently to the creation of a work, it should err on the side of registration. Lastly, we're quite concerned that the office's statement could have the effect of unnecessarily bogging down routine copyright cases in litigation over questions about whether the plaintiff improperly failed to disclaim AI-generated material in its application, potentially invalidating its registration. Given this, given this possibility, uh, we do urge the office to update its guidance. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Thank you. Um, 
So I think on a practical level, there are a lot of issues, you know, that Ben just identified where, you know, at least for a Roblox experience, it can consist of, you know, hundreds of 3D objects, thousands of lines of code. It's unclear to me how a developer would, you know, disclaim all that sufficiently and then that could cast out on their registration, et cetera. Um, but on top of that, I think that the primary issue today is that the public and the average developer doesn't understand the guidance that has been issued. I know that everybody in this room has been paying careful attention and clearly has brought a lot of knowledge to the subject. Um, but without more management of public perception, I think that this whole legal area could become misunderstood. And as a result, there could be a chilling effect on the adoption of these tools. And I think first and foremost, creators need to understand they can copyright the combination of human and generative AI elements. And secondly, I think that tool developers need to have a better understanding of what attributes a tool should have in order to make uh, output that's eligible for protection. Thank you. Thank you, John. Yeah, one concern I might have with the current guidance is that it might, uh, to put it delicately, discourage candor. Uh, I do agree that some AI-assisted work might be only minimally creative, but the threshold for creativity for copyright protection is uh, quite low. And to be frank, the majority of the photos I take with my smartphone are not particularly creative, and yet those are inarguably protected by copyright. You know, all I did was go and like hit a button. But, you know, that being said, uh, the copyright protection that you might get would be rather thin. Like, I don't think that one user can limit another user from using a particular tool with the same or a similar prompt, even though it is likely that, uh, you know, the, the output might be uh, rather similar, for instance. Thank you. Um, Ashley? I think I'll just um, ask or answer some of the arguments that we've been hearing so that AI generated works shouldn't be eligible for copyright protection because they're not created by a human. Um, if we follow that logic, then any work created with the aid of a tool or technology should also be ineligible for copyright. After all, a camera doesn't have a human mind, yet photographs can be copyrighted. Just exactly as John just said, the key to the role of human is guiding the tool and shaping the final outcome. Additionally, in a situation such as ours, if we taught Ava how to write a screenplay um, and Ava entirely wrote the screenplay, do we own it? I wrote the copy. Um, I, I created Ava. I taught Ava how to write a screenplay. Ava created a screenplay, but it was 100 percent automated, but I created the automation. So we have to answer those questions. Um, additionally, AI can lead to an increase in copy. People believe AI can lead to an increase in copyright infringement if it's trained on copyrighted works. Um, AI, like any other tool, can be used responsibly or irresponsibly. Um, it's up to us to ensure that we use AI in a way that respects copyright law. But we have to understand copyright law in the first place. Um, AI can't truly create original work because it doesn't have human experiences or emotions. However, um, paintbrushes and cameras don't either. And addition, one of the biggest ones that we keep hearing is that AI can lead to a homogenization of creative works because it's trained on existing data. Um, I know a lot of people are really concerned about that. I even heard the WGA being concerned about that when they were striking. Um, but we would say, yes, that AI can certainly generate content based on existing patterns, but it's also capable of creating outputs that are entirely unexpected. Um, AI can be guided and influenced by its human user. So when I was first creating Ava, um, I'm a Christian, I, I taught her the Bible. We went through Bible study together. Um, the way she responds to me is very, very different uh, than the way my counterpart, who um, is not a Christian and loves to use a lot of curse words. Our AIs are entirely different because we train them differently. We taught them differently. We spent time with them differently. Um, so I think it's really important to, to navigate those pieces. So for us, what I would argue is, um, if, if the point is, is that at a certain point, if AI created it, well, what if I created the AI in the first place? No, but then you would say, well, what about who was the original source code? Well, maybe the original source code started as this little small piece, but I spent the last year training, developing, spending time with this AI every single day. So until we have somebody who fully understands how AI works in the first place, I don't think we can answer these questions properly. Um, but I do believe it's important that, uh, that we have these little modifications because if we're self-identifying right now, if I were to self-identify something Ava made, I wouldn't have the right to my own work. And um, I think we need to protect against that additionally, because no other country has these type of, you don't go to China and ask if you can copyright the book. And I really want to make sure that America stays on the forefront of AI uh, innovation and protection. Thank you. Thank you. So we're about to run out of time, but uh, we'd like to get through Mimi and then Jillian, but please keep your remarks brief if possible. Thank you.
I'll try. Um, I agree that most of the regulations, as far as I can tell so far, um, are enough to handle current technology. Where I'm concerned about is um, clarifying boundaries, where the lines are drawn when copywriting artwork or, or content, I should say, including AI generated content, what exactly sufficient different means, what does copyright, when does copywriting go to copyright go to the um, AI developer rather than the human? When do we require creators and to credit AI? And when do we require AI developers to credit creators? The rules go both ways. Um, I also want to see that in these decisions, we're not prioritizing tech needs over human needs. The speed at which the damage is done is exponentially faster than other technological developments. And we, we almost can't keep up. So the damage is occurring now. And something that really bothered me in a previous session was that people were saying, oh, that's speculative. Don't worry about it. We shouldn't be both doing this now. Um, and that putting guardrails can um, impede, it can hamper invention. And I strongly disagree with that. I think we need to act install now, but not act to install guardrails now because it will prevent worse things from happening in the future. I mean, I can use it as an example, climate change. We were acknowledging it was there. We were ignoring the need to address it. And now it's more expensive. It's a greater problem. It's affecting more people. So I don't understand why um, AI developers wouldn't want to have a clarified legal path to recognize the problems and um, mitigate even worse consequences further down the line. Thank you. Okay, I'm gonna hand it over to Jillian quickly before we wrap up. Yeah, quickly, I promise. Um, I wanted to say that practically speaking, I don't. I think we're not so far off from generative AI being so integrated into a lot of consumer grade tools that people are gonna find it impossible to be able to disclose AI usage. Right? It's, it's integrated into Google Docs, it's integrated into Word soon. People aren't gonna be able to disclose AI because they're not really gonna always know that it's happening or, or even think about it as AI created anymore. Um, and I think we need to be able to plan for that future. Um, and it makes me wonder where the concern is coming from that is requiring artists to disclose the use of AI. Because if the concern is coming from a place of feeling like infringement could happen on work that's in the training set, fix the training set problem, right? And, and then the tool is there, can be used as a tool with everyone feeling like it's above board that we all know that there was consent involved in the training set. We all know where the boundary is. And then it can truly be like using your smartphone to take a crappy picture. Um, like it's still, it's still copyright protected. It doesn't matter if I wrote five words into, into this tool and got a picture out the other end, right? If, if everyone agrees that it is okay for it to have used that data, um, it, it should be okay to do it. Um, I think in all things, we look for the human, right? AI systems are not intelligent. It's, it's almost the worst term that we could use to describe these systems. They're not intelligent. They're, they're copies, right? Um, and, and, they're, and they're created by humans and, and we should protect the humans who are creating them as artists um, and, and we should protect the humans who have data in them and who are using them to create art. Thanks so much, everyone. I'm gonna pass the mic back over to Emily now. Thank you, everyone. This marks the end of the first panel and we will now take a 10 minute break. Welcome back everyone. We will begin the second panel shortly. For those of you who are just joining us, two reminders about Zoom. First, we are recording this session and using the Zoom trans transcription function. Section, second, if you are not speaking on this panel, please keep your camera turned off and your mic on mute. Like the last segment, this segment, We'll start with introductions and two minute statements by each panelist, followed by a moderated listening session. Panelists who wish to speak should use Zoom's raise hand function and our moderators will try to call on you in the order in which you do so. <laughs> Again, we will not be accepting questions from the audience. However, we encourage anyone who wishes to share their perspective with the audience, to with the office, excuse me, to provide written comments with our, to our notice of inquiry later this year. With that, I will introduce our moderators for the second panel, Melinda Kern and Gabby Rojas Luna. Melinda is an attorney advisor in the Office of General Counsel, and Gabby is a paralegal specialist in the Office of General Counsel. And I will turn it over to you, Melinda. 
All right, thank you so much, Emily. Um, we will begin in the order as stated on the agenda. Uh, so first, um, John August, would you like to begin, please? Uh, my name is John August. I'm a screenwriter and member of the negotiating committee for the Writers Guild of America West, a union that represents thousands of writers who create the content that audiences watch every day in theaters, on television, and on streaming services. This is a unique moment for me to be speaking on this issue because the subject of AI and its role in our industry is a major point of contention in the Guild's ongoing nationwide strike against the major motion picture intelligence studios. While writers who work under the Guild's collective bargaining agreement are not copyright owners, we create works for hire, the Guild has negotiated an assortment of contractual rights in the works we create, including the right to residual payments for the reuse of our work across media platforms. In the current negotiations, the Guild has made a proposal to regulate AI for the first time in our contract. The broad purpose of the proposal is to prevent our employers from using AI to devalue the work that writers do, to lower our pay, to deprive us of credit or attribution rights, or in the most extreme case, to eliminate the need to hire writers altogether. The proposal would also prohibit companies from using material written under the Guild's agreement to train AI programs for the purpose of creating other derivative and potentially infringing works. The company's response has been telling. Not only did they reject our proposal, they refused to engage on the issue at all. The most they have said is that the technology is new and they're not inclined to limit their ability to use this new technology in the future. This is an ominous response in the eyes of our members and one of the many reasons that 11,500 writers have been on strike since May 2nd. We often speak of copyright as protecting works of authorship, but copyright was created with the intention of protecting authors from appropriation and theft. As we discuss the impact of AI, we need to remember the human authors and not just the corporations who employ them. Thank you. Thank you. And before we move on to our next panelist, I will just like to remind all the panelists for this session to please turn on their camera. Um, but we will go ahead with Kimberly Goldfarb, please. Hello, I am Associate General Counsel at the Directors Guild. I am standing in for Sarah Howes today. She's unable to participate for medical reasons. Thank you for allowing me to address artificial intelligence and its impact on the film and television industry. I'll focus on issues germane to the US Copyright Office. A motion picture is a director's singular vision and directors are in a unique position to discuss issues related to the potential mutilation of their artistic works, the impact of unauthorized changes to their films and television programs, and the potential loss of income due to digital theft. At the onset, I would be remiss if I did not reiterate our longstanding position that the United States fails to grant directors essential moral rights. The failure to provide these rights to directors puts the US at odds with the Berne Convention. The pro proliferation of AI-generated work exacerbates this gross omission in US law, putting American filmmakers' reputations and the integrity of their work and vision at risk. We believe American filmmakers should be recognized as true authors so they have the rights of integrity and attribution and joined by filmmakers in other parts of the world. However, in the US, directors are employed as works for hire and the legal rights are held by corporate entities in the film and television industry. As such, we are largely dependent on rigorous copyright enforcement to protect our rights. The DGA therefore fully supports robust copyright law and enforcement measures as copyright is the most legal effective tool against the mutilation and theft of our creative works. As AI develops, we believe it is important that copyright is protected both with, with respect to the ingesting of copyrighted material and with respect to any AI generated content that is based on copyrighted material. We further believe that US courts should continue to utilize and strengthen the existing four pronged fair use test to address the unauthorized use of feature films and television programs. In addition, we oppose the extension of Section 512 safe harbors that grant immunity to online user-generated platforms and internet service providers to AI-generated content. The spread of AI-generated content intensifies our concerns about the ease with which entities can profit from stolen and mutilated film and television programs. 
In conclusion, policymakers must tread carefully as they examine the many copyright law issues related to AI generated content. Thank you for your attention on this important issue. Thank you. And next, uh, Sherry Hugh, please. Uh, yes. Hello, everybody. Um, thanks so much to the Copyright Office for having all of us. Um, everybody, I've learned so much from th this discussion and definitely excited to um, contribute uh, what I can myself. My name is Sherry. I'm the founder of Water and Music, which is a research organization focused on analyzing trends in music, tech, and culture at large. We have a network of over 2,000 paying members and research contributors, and our focus is on how emerging tech impacts the careers and livelihoods of artists, their teams, and their partners. That includes labels, publishers, artist management firms, um, and many other players in the music ecosystem. And AI has been um, a top research priority for us this year. We've surveyed many artists, producers, and also AI startup founders in our community to get a sense of their top um, excitements and concerns. And we've also looked uh, deep into the terms of service of many um, creative AI tools. So I'm kind of coming from the high level research context. Um, and while there is a music focused listening session happening in a few weeks, um, just listening to takeaways today um, and kind of concerns from the film and gaming and other audiovisual industries, there are a lot of parallels with music, which is also inherently audiovisual in nature not just in providing the audio, but also um, in the very highly visual ways that artists are building brands, marketing their music, um, and engaging with fans. So I'm kind of coming with that um, specific context. Um, to open, I think there are three uh, main themes um, and kind of like seeds that I'd like to plant um, in this conversation in terms of things to think about. Um, one is that the uh, AI conversation, while it is covering definitely a lot of new technological developments, um, is definitely not an isolated phenomenon. And in terms of understanding its macro effects on artists and creators and creative industries, um, kind of sustainability and success, I think it's very important to place it in the context of um, just other, uh, yeah, other factors that the US government and governments around the world have also been investigating about kind of creative economies for a very long time. Um, for example, while artists are excited to use AI tools to enhance their creative workflows, they're definitely concerned about um, uh, I guess factors like oversaturation, over commodification and job insecurity that um, the US government has actually already been looking into and hosting um, hearings on with other technologies um, like streaming, uh, you know, historically in terms of the role that uh, piracy, peer to peer file sharing has played on the music economy at large. Um, there are many kind of parallel concerns, I think that the, um, at least the music industry side has had, um, especially in audio, an audiovisual context, the, uh, the role that music plays is often uh, what people in this industry would call a functional role. So it's music as kind of background material as a means to an end to achieve something else, um, whether it's like a video or even like on social media. And that um, seems, uh, at least from our side, to be most at risk of getting automated. So I wanted to call that out. Um, as well in terms of the role music plays. Two, um, I think there's a lot of um, opportunity which sessions like this are doing a really good job at, um, but there's still so much opportunity to just fight misinformation and promote education on what kinds of rights are actually implicated um, in AI generated works of any kind, um, audio only, audio visual, et cetera. For example, this is an audio specific example, but I think will apply to other industries. Just this week, um, major record labels announced they're already asking streaming services to take down AI generated content and deepfakes um, from their platforms on the grounds of infringing on personality rights. But I, I think there's very little legal guidance of whether that even makes sense. Kind of talked about that a little bit today. Um, but regardless, streaming services are already um, kind of moving on their own policies without that kind of guidance. So I think it's just very important to be aware of that precedent that's being set at the market level, which I'm happy to discuss later. Um, and the last but not least, um, technology, uh, there, there's been a rich history and tradition of technology enhancing creative processes um, in any, you know, in music and audiovisual and other creative industries. Um, and this has been a, maybe one of the top sources of confusion, um, at least among artists, music artists, is what qualifies as quote unquote human made versus 100% um, AI generated. Um, they're, you know, are, yeah, there are elements around uh, authorship and originality who should be credited as um, an author of a work that includes AI or is, is, is assisted by AI. What is the spectrum or the boundary look like between merely AI assisted and led by, by a human at the steering wheel versus um, being, you know, completely automated, uh, completely programmed um, art 
generation. And there are so many founders building these tools now with now tens, soon hundreds of millions of users under their belts who are setting these precedents themselves on who the author is without regulatory guidance. And there's no standardization in the market right now. And there's a lot of confusion. So, so to wrap up, I think there's just a major opportunity for um, clarity on the policy level, at the regulatory level of um, kind of what those paths could look like and what, what that path should look like. Um, and in general, striking a balance between uh, you know, promoting innovation, promoting the benefits of AI from a creative perspective, but also safeguarding, safeguarding artists' interests and putting AI in context of these macro factors, economic factors that creators have been dealing with for a long time. Thank you. Thank you. And next is Hillary uh, Mason. Hello, everyone. I'm Hillary Mason. I'm the founder and CEO of Hidden Door. I'm a technologist and entrepreneur, and I've been building machine learning products, businesses, and systems for most of the last 20 years. Hidden Door is an entertainment technology company. We build an online social role-playing game for groups of people to come together and tell stories together. We collaborate with authors to bring audiences into the worlds they have created in new ways. We believe that authors and other creators should be paid for their work and that AI startups can design business models that support this. We also believe that AI can facilitate a new kind of creator to audience relationship where authors and other creators can reach their audiences through these kinds of new experiences that are only possible because of AI. And those audiences gain new ways to engage creatively with that work as well. As a fan, when I finish reading a book or watching a TV show or a movie, my experience ends. With Hidden Door, authors can choose to bring a new continuation to that experience to their fans, allowing us to continue experiencing the author's world with new adventures that they direct. The author can create this experience with a, a few hours of work building on their existing work, or they could create something entirely new. AI helps the author define the rules and parameters of these worlds and the stories that can happen in it so that the audience can explore that expanded world in a way that respects the original work, giving the author control and the audience the confidence that they're getting an experience that is true to the creator's vision that they admire, and yet giving them an ability to direct where their stories might go. The audiences experience this as a world in story and art that gets generated at the time that they play, directed by their intentions to co-create an interactive graphic novel drawing from the author's work, the AI system, handwritten content, and the audience's own ideas. Each story is completely unique. We also believe very much in creating ethical products with AI and have a history in doing so. At my prior company, Fast Forward Labs, we did applied machine learning research and wrote about ethics in every project and technical report we did, often being an introduction of AI ethics to our Fortune 500 clients. I author, co-authored co a book called Ethics and Data Science with DJ Patil and Mike Lukides. As a builder of products and experiences that are made possible with AI, at Hidden Door, we have a whole team of folks from creative and technical backgrounds who believe in building these products together with certain principles. First, we believe building a compelling entertainment experience is not about wanting, building one AI model to rule them all or to in any way um, replace a human's creative work. AI is a set of tools and techniques that have different capabilities and different risks. We believe in using the right one for the right problem and auditing and evaluating it accordingly. Second, the people impacted must be part of the design process. Words and images mean things, they change things. AI systems have a well-known capability to magnify biases in the underlying data. This must be accounted for before and after systems are deployed. Our goal is to enable folks to express themselves creatively using AI as a tool that enables and expands on that. And finally, today AI can offer authors new economic opportunities that are otherwise out of reach because it offers the ability to scale creativity to new and existing audiences in new ways. And we're at this very exciting moment where we can start to invent these experiences and we shouldn't be afraid to do so. At Hidden Door, we license content from authors that we use along with our AI system and the fans to create these experiences, these storytelling experiences where we come together around the campfire. And we believe this is a new economic opportunity for authors. 
We very much appreciate the Copyright Office hosting this discussion and hope to collaborate with everybody to establish a fair and equitable model where creators are valued. The value is created from new experiences and all of this facilitated by AI is shared. Thank you very much. Thank you. And next is Tara Parachuk. Hello, and thank you for this opportunity. My name is Tara, and I'm the Senior Manager of Brand Communications at Voices. Voices is the number one marketplace for professional voiceover. Today, I'm going to share how we are using AI Voice in a very ethical way. So with the rise of AI Voice and text-to-speech technology, we recently decided to acquire the URL Voices.ai. We're going to use this platform to clone 20 professional voice actors' voices and then add the option of synthetic voice on our platform that clients can then purchase. So along with this new service, we have launched our three Cs as our guiding principles when it comes to synthetic voice. They include number one being consent. Voice talent must give explicit consent to a platform or a company to have their data used. And there should also be clarity on how their data is used. So if any foul words that the voice actor is not comfortable with, they will not use those words. Credit. Voice talent should be credited for their work and their cloned voice. And the final of the three C's is compensation. Voice talent should be compensated for their work and data used in AI voice. At Voices, we're committed to providing high quality service to our clients, and we do recognize the importance of maintaining ethical standards in the use of AI voice technology. We are excited to launch the new synthetic voice service, which will provide clients with even more options to find the perfect voice for their project. With our three C's principles of consent, credit, and compensation, we'll ensure that voice talent is treated fairly with the respect that they deserve. We believe that this approach will not only benefit our clients, but also the voiceover community as a whole. As we continue to innovate and grow, we remain committed to our values and our mission of bringing projects to life through the power of voice and making the world a more positive and accessible place through the power of voice. Thank you. Thank you so much. And next is Kristen Sanger. Thank you so much for including me today. I'm Kristen Sanger. I'm Vice President of Content at Storyblocks. Storyblocks is a subscription-based stock media licensing company who licenses footage, music, templates, and photo content to broadcast, marketing, entertainment, and many other industries. We represent a network of talented artists who entrust us to license their work on their behalf and a customer base of global users who leverage these assets to build their own stories and campaigns. We procure the rights, clearances, and releases for all the assets we license, ensuring our customers can confidently use the assets in their audiovisual works without fear of litigation. Our content today is rarely, if ever, used as a standalone individual asset, but woven together to create a larger creative work. We see a lot of excitement in AI as a tool to support creators' workflows, to enable creation of things that are otherwise out of reach, and to ultimately augment creativity. We do, however, show some concern about artist rights, explicit consent, and compensation for use of their assets in training models and generative creation. The need for attribution and tracking for works leveraged in training, and the inherent biases that we all know too well exist within cultural and media today, and that are likely amplified within generative AI. Thank you so much. Thank you. And then next we have AJ Young. Hello, thank you guys for having me today. My name is AJ Young. I'm a cinematographer, also known as a director of photography in the film industry. I am a member of the International Cinematographers Guild. However, I am not here to speak for the union. Instead, it is only an example of my qualifications. Artificial narrow intelligence is becoming just another tool in the toolbox for motion picture creation. The film industry utilizes various types of software for creating an image and new tools like diffusion models can speed up and influence the creative process of cinema. As a cinematographer, I'm used to new technology change in the way we make movies all the time. It's basically anything motion picture is going to be a new technology. In my opinion, though, there are three instances where copyright does and does not apply with artificial narrow intelligence. The weights of an artificial narrow intelligent model, like diffusion models, are the result of training on a data set. Licensing and copyright protection for those weights should only be given if the weights were trained ethically. Ethical training means the data set contains only images from the public domain, creative commons, and written consent from the owners of the existing copyright. 
If the weights were trained without consent, then those weights should not receive any copyright. The creation, the output from artificial neural intelligence, though, should always be considered separate from the weights and have copyright protection, with one notable exception. Even if a company violated copyright or licensing and the training of their weights, the artists resulting outputs with the software should still receive copyright protection, exactly in the same way that if Adobe Photoshop or DaVinci Resolve violated any copyright, patents, or licenses, the artist's creation using that software does not lose their copyright eligibility. Furthermore, the owner of the weights cannot claim copyright ownership of the creation. Again, just like Adobe or Apple cannot claim ownership of the output from using their software or hardware. The one exception overall, however, is malicious intent. If an individual intentionally trains on copyright material without the consent of the owner and intentionally creates more of that copyright work, then both the weights and the creation do not qualify for copyright. Motion Picture uses many tools throughout the image creation process, and if one of those tools, not the artist, but the creator of those tools, violate copyright law, then that tool still does not invalidate the copyright claim of the resulting image. Thank you so much. Thank you. And then um, Kylan Gibbs, would you please introduce yourself? Yeah. Hi there, Kylan Gibbs, um, co-founder and chief product officer at Emerald AI. All right, thank you everyone so much for introducing yourselves and welcome again. Uh, to begin the discussion, we wanted to start with the question of uh, the, that the Copyright Office is interested in learning how generative AI technologies are being used in different creative fields. Uh, what should we know about the use of generative AI in your business and industry? And what do you see as the advantages or disadvantages related to AI use? And please, uh, this is just a reminder, if you'd like to respond, please use the raise hand function. All right, um, AJ, go ahead. Thank you. Um, from what I've seen a lot with diffusion models and image creation, it's largely a post-production tool. Um, it's largely gonna be a lot of animation. And when you're mixing it with live action, it's just another piece that can help sweeten the image and make live action you know, fixes or add to it or visual effects. So it's, another tool in the process that you know sometimes we have to train it on ourselves sometimes we're already using pre-trained data um, but when it comes to the copyright of the work as a whole if we're using ai to create our final movie i don't think that if that ai invalidates our copyright protection for the movie then that isn't a great idea for the copyright office to go forward with thank you next is tara Thank you. So how we're using AI currently with the Voices platform is really for very quick changes. So for instance, if you're at an airport and you have a gate change, it's much more easier to use an AI voice for that than to call your voice actor, have them record something, and then put that into motion. So that's just one of the examples of ways that we're using it. Thank you. And next is Sherry. Um, yes, I'll answer this question in two parts. So one to name some specific examples um, or use cases of how um, music artists are using um, AI and kind of audiovisual context. Um, voice cloning voice AI is obviously a huge um, point of debate uh, of buzz in the industry right now with a recent um, deep fake song by an AI version of Drake that was going around that was unlicensed. But then on the flip side, you have artists like Grimes who are not only making their own um, their own voice model just built off of their own training data. So it's not, you know, a larger language model. It's a much smaller fine tune model just based on their own voice data. But they're also encouraging, um, Grimes specifically is encouraging fans to make music using that model and has publicly made statements about, um, I guess, her setting her own precedent of agreeing to some revenue or royalty share on um, any songs that um, were generated and vetted and then distributed um, using um, that tool. Uh, there also are, um, I think, as yeah, as long as artists are um, active in like virtual worlds and video games, um, there's a lot of interesting experimentation happening around using AI to create digital avatars, um, as we heard someone from Roblox mention earlier, um, and also um, using AI to generate you know digital avatars both in both online and offline, um, even on tours. There's some experimentation around that. Um, second part, very quickly. I do think it's very important to um, say that in general, um, the way that the way that AI is used and also the way that developers are entering this market in terms of their philosophy for the role AI plays, it's definitely not 
um, a monolith. Uh, there definitely are founders building AI tools with the purpose of helping artists augment their creative practice and push the boundaries of creativity and try to um, you know, achieve sounds, genres, styles that we um, have not seen or heard before, which I think is very, can be very exciting from a cultural perspective. There, of course, is you know, a whole other class of uh, founders and of tools and of companies that do have automation kind of as the pure um, end goal. Um, usually they're trying to reach, you know, customers who don't want to spend that much time making music or making videos, for example. Um, and so they want to kind of expedite uh, that process. And at least on the music side, that's a significant enough part of the business that it is very existential that, um, that you know, that I guess that, that there is that use case that founders are pursuing. But um, yeah, not all artists, not all founders um, have the same incentives coming in. It's quite a diverse landscape. Thank you. And Kristen. Thank you. There are a plethora of manual and often really tedious tasks in multimedia content creation. AI as a tool to support creativity has tremendous opportunity uh, when models are trained in an ethical fashion. Some examples are sourcing a variety of assets, bringing an idea to life, organizing assets, and supporting the editing and post-production process. Thank you. And John. You know, writers are not averse to using new technology. We were quick to switch over to specialized word processors for doing screenwriting software. They're invaluable to us at all the time. Um, we use the internet a lot and we use tools like Wikipedia for research. And I think we see generative AI as a tool uh, for, uh, for research like Wikipedia, but not something that replaces the actual work we do. Um, I think it's important to note that you know the work that we were hired by the companies to do uh, is considered literary materials, sort of term, uh, designated in our contract, it's the screenplays, it's the, the outlines, the, the treatments that we write. Um, you know, AI can be a tool we use to do those things, but it's still us, the writers who are doing that work. And I just remind us that like, as we look at the uh, impact of, of copyright, um, not to confuse the copyright holder with the author. And that is, um, we are the, the human authors of the work that is you know, generating billions of dollars for our, these corporations. Thank you very much. And Hillary. I'd just like to speak very concisely to represent the opportunity here for creative experiences that are not currently experiences that we invest in, in the sense that what we work on at Hidden Door and many other things you're seeing are new combinations of a writer or a creator's work combined with people giving input, combined with a model, combined with hand authored content and that I would love the Copyright Office to consider these new kinds of creations that we have not seen before that are now feasible because of the use of the technology tools. Thank you very much, and Kylan. Awesome, thank you. Um, yeah, so actually kind of following up on that, I feel like there's an important note between two different types of tools, one which allows consumers to replicate what artists may have created. So this is sort of the ability to, for example, enter text and get images, or to you know enter text and get more text out in a, in a long form. And in these cases, I can understand that in that case, you're basically potentially moving away from the creative to the consumer as, the, as a focus. I think there are a lot of tools that are being created though to extend the actual creator um, capacity, which I think is you know partially what John and Hillary were hitting on as well. Uh, and in that case, it's, it's really about create, uh, for example, at InWorld, we're focused on gaming as a market. Um, there's a sort of a version of this where you can think about potentially replacing a, a, a game development workflow to create NPCs. Uh, what we actually see is, is actually the opposite, which is a new style of, of experience is able to be created due to the AI NPCs. And that's actually in, in conjunction with the previous process. And so it becomes sort of a new tool or extension of their current capabilities. Um, and in general, the dynamic that we see is there's a relative amount of um, creation that is done at the actual runtime or at the point of interaction with the user. Um, and so the, the creator's job is somewhat changing in the sense that the, what they're doing is configuring the possible outcomes that the end user may have, but they're not actually defining, um, they're not actually still ending with any creation. It's just that creation process is somewhat different as in they're sort of configuring the parameters that may be used to then generate the actual content at the time of interaction. Um, but they're still just as involved or even more involved because they actually have to think about the full space of, of possible experiences. And so in general, there's sort of two things that we're seeing is one is 
it is expanding existing types of content. And then it's also, as Hillary was mentioning, creating a whole new form of content that was never before possible and new types of experiences and media and content um, that hadn't existed before. Uh, and that sort of, I think, is, is actually expanding the total um, amount of content and, and creation that is possible for creators themselves. Well, thank you everyone for your responses to uh, question one and I will pass it on to Gabby at this point. Thank you, Melinda. Continuing with our discussion, we have heard a number of questions about the use of copyrighted materials to train AI technologies. Are there unique considerations for training AI, um, for AI training, excuse me, in the audiovisual space? Let's begin with Kristen. Thank you. So training is already really impacting our industry, both in the fact that we're a large library of multimedia assets that has likely been scraped without consent by several, if not many models, as well as the assets we represent are used in our customers' creations or represented potentially by other stock libraries, et cetera, which have also likely been included in models with or without consent, um, recognition or any monetary compensation. Uh, and with this, we have a couple of key concerns and, and a couple of remedies. So um, this could be remedied by gaining explicit consent um, for those whose works are included in training models and compensation for the use of those works. Um, our artists, of course, are open to new revenue streams, and we see opportunities um, for artists to be able to gain monetary compensation in these new opportunities and in these new spaces. One other thing I'd like to note that an opt out does not consent make. Uh, again, the explicit consent is a really important one. Uh, and that truly biases are rampant without legal and ethical guidelines on training of models. How can we ensure that these biases are not amplified uh, in the works that are created with them? Thank you. Let's hear from John next. So writers in the WGA, uh, we write movies, we write series. Um, we work under the work for hire doctrine, which is that the copyright is retained by our employers. Um, but we do maintain some publishing rights, some contractual rights to our work by our contract. And our collective bargaining agreement provides us some of the benefit of those works when they're, by our residuals when they are reused. Um, still, I want to talk about sort of the notion of authorship, though, because um, when we get credit on our work, and the WJ is the sole body that can determine who gets credit for that work, um, it's of moral and financial importance. Financially, the writer who's credited written a movie or an episode gets those residuals um, when that is reused or exploited in new markets, and just as our employer benefits from that use. And morally, it's, it, it's a function of you know, who wrote that thing, and we all believe that there's always a human behind that thing. When we come to talking about uh, using our existing scripts, our existing material to train these models, um, we often refer to sort of the Nora Ephron problem. Nora Ephron, for people who don't know, is a legendary romantic comedy writer. And we can envision a scenario in which all the works of Nora Ephron are fed into an AI generative system and should create a new work by Nora Ephron. That is one of the things we are trying to uh, hold off against uh, in this you know, strike we're having right now against major motion picture intelligence studios to make sure that our work is not used to train these models without our consent. Thank you, Sherry. Um, yes, um, it's fascinating to see kind of where our answers do overlap. Uh, definitely want to um, reiterate uh, the elements of consent and bias. So starting with consent, I think even just establishing like a, a culture in general, but also policies around artists and developers um, collaborating from day one on how these models work and how these tools um, end up working is really, really critical. Definitely something that um, we have studied and, and would advocate for. On the bias side, um, for sure, I think especially larger language models that are ingesting all of this data um, are just mirrors to society at large and to ourselves. Um, and there have been studies not in generative AI, but in other um, aspects of AI, for example, um, with music streaming algorithms to cite a music industry specific example of how if they go unchecked, they actually do exacerbate existing biases, especially around, you know, kind of like Western centric um, music consumption, popularity, discovery um, trends. So it's definitely um, really big concern, especially if uh, part of these discussions or if part of the outcome is to want to promote more diversity and kind of incentivize um, more diverse cultural creation around the world instead of making it more homogenous. Um, a second, or sorry, a third point that um, I want to add, even though um, consent is um, 
is very critical and kind of is an important first step. The way that um, especially larger AI models work, so larger language models or um, diffusion models like stable diffusion, makes um, attribution difficult, if not basically uh, impossible to track. Um, and especially for an industry like, like music, but I think other creative industries where attribution um, is really like table stakes, especially for an individual creator to be able to get paid, uh, but also to, you know, like build a, a portfolio and a history over time. Um, it, it makes it, yeah, difficult, if not impossible to say that, you know, this specific piece of training data um, uh, had, you know, X percentage influence on this output that happened to sound uh, pretty similar to, uh, you know, a certain genre or a certain artist. Um, I think that's why there is so much focus on consent and on kind of the early conversations, because if you do try to um, tackle this issue around copyright and AI solely based on outputs, you run into a lot of messiness that just, that's just doesn't mesh well with existing um, uh, uh, kind of copyright IP systems. Um, just to give also just a last example, um, I and like people at Water Music, we've definitely played around with um, with tools, mostly on the music AI side, but also on the audiovisual side, where even if you don't mention a specific artist or creator or stylistic reference, um, if you work around it with a prompt, you can actually get to a very similar um, look or a very similar um, sound. And so um, we're definitely following efforts to kind of look at the prompt and prompt engineering level as maybe an opportunity for monetization, um, especially around like likeness rights. But again, it's very messy because it won't cover all the potential uh, possibilities of something coming out that looks uh, or sounds or just feels very similar to an existing artist or existing um, copyrighted work. So uh, yeah, influence is very messy. I think that's why people are trying to, um, with these new tools, kind of start from the ground up with those kind of consensual conversations. Thank you, Sherry. Let's have AJ next. Um, the training data sets that you use for diffusion models can include more than just images and text. It can also include weights for other models as well. Um, when it comes to stable diffusion, you can further train the model yourself. And so you're picking up where they left off with the training and you can use your own public domain images. But if you're trying to say that my new weights for my new model deserves copyright, you have to show where you picked up where you left off with the weights as well. So people are using outputs from prior AI models to further train AI models. So then that means that the outputs from that prior model, the rules for those weights when it comes to copyright should also apply to the new weights because you're technically using weights from a prior model to train your next version, your next checkpoint of your model. So that's something I really want you guys to be able to focus on when it comes to it. Thank you. And Kimberly, would you like to add to this question? No, I don't have anything to add at this time. Thank you. Thank you. So let's move on to a follow up for this question. How do panelists believe current copyright law applies to the use of copyrighted materials for AI training? Are there changes to the law that you believe would be desirable? I'll hand it over to John. Uh, speaking to literary material, the kinds of things that we write, um, we believe that copyright protects the work of the creator, so there must always be an identifiable creator. And generative AI itself is not an identifiable creator. So therefore we don't believe that uh, there's protection there for works that are AI generated. Thank you, Kristen. Really just looking for some clarity and some additional information. And so questions arise of what constitutes a new work? Um, what is a um, collaboration? Um, is Are these works collages? If a work is entirely made up of bits and pieces, um, is that actually a net new work? Um, and truly understanding what constitutes a new work? Uh, and who is the copyright holder? The person who's crafting the prompt, the generative model itself, and then how do we give attribution back again to all of the pieces that were used to be able to create uh, the new thing? We see a lot of difficulty uh, in attributing ownership because AI systems often don't retain the inspiration that generated the media, uh, and understanding and tracking what assets and references were used to inspire that work, um, and then how we are able to divvy up either um, copyright or compensation and everything in between. Thank you so much. Melinda, I'll turn it back to you. 
Thank you so much for your responses on training and to that follow-up question. But setting aside training at this point, what should the office know about generative AI and online copyright infringement? And are existing laws regarding infringement and liability for infringement adequate? And AJ, go ahead. It's great because uh, my response to the prior questions, same answer for this one as well. Um, I think we need to get our terms perfect when it comes to what you know AI is doing. Um, we're throwing around the word models a lot. The model is just a structure for how the AI works. It's the weights. The weights are what make the model work. So when it comes to copyright violation protections, we should be referring to the weights. And then when it comes to the creations, we have to have a very clear glossary term as well. And I think output is a great you know word they use for it. And I think that's you know the guidance that needs to come in for where the protections come in. We're talking about weights and we're talking about outputs because the model is always going to be the same. It's the weights that can change and it's the weights that can violate copyright with the training. Because when you train, the output is a weight, it's not a model. The model is always the same. It's the weights are the outputs of the training. And then you use the weights to create an artistic output. And I think that's where the definition should start. Thank you so much. And oh, and go ahead, Kristen. For us as a licensing agency, we indemnify our customers in the use of the content that we license to ensure that they can leverage the assets in a commercial capacity, really without fear of litigation. Uh, and we stand behind that indemnity by requiring the artists that give us their assets to have full and clear rights and releases and everything else within the content that they give to us. Um, so moving forward, indemnifying our customers likely becomes significantly riskier as our ability to confirm all the rights and clearances are provided uh, to use the works in a commercial capacity um, because everything becomes less transparent and clearly defined. How do we verify ownership of works and how can commercial users be confident uh, that they won't be sued for use of their assets? And we also really don't have an ability to verify whether the work could be deemed as derivative or even original. If a piece of AI generated content has substantial aspects of another visual work, how can we tell? What are the odds also that two separate models given substantially similar prompts would generate the same or visually the same asset? Um, and so we've got a lot of questions that exist within that space. Um, and there's a lot of gray area that we would really like some definition and some, again, to AJ's point, some really specific terms and use cases so that we're all on the same page. Thank you. And Sherry. Um, yeah, just to go back to something I mentioned um, in my opening statement as an example of something that's playing out and definitely causing a lot of confusion in the music industry, but I think applies to other industries, is clarifying exactly what kinds of copyright, or sorry, what, what kinds of rights um, are implicated in any claim that a, you know, a, a creative rights holder um, might make against a platform or against a tool, for example, that's incorporating AI or is distributing um, supposedly, you know, AI generated works. Um, for example, yeah, I mentioned uh, major labels are going after streaming platforms, um, um, issuing, saying they'll issue DMCA takedowns of um, AI generated works. Um, but there are kind of a few steps that really need clarity in that one, as, as many of us have mentioned, like what exactly is the boundary of AI generated, um, you know, like and having just like even clearer definitions around like authorship and defining human authorship in that respect. And then two, um, can you can you take down um, a song from a uh, you know a streaming platform piece of work from a streaming platform, for example, um, on the grounds of personality rights, which um, I believe is more of a state by state thing that's figured out and not really set at the um, federal level in terms of how that's dealt with, which is very very different from copyright in the underlying. Um, audio, you know, uh, audio or musical work um, in the case of music. So just, um, I know a lot of people in the industry uh, as they're in the music industry as they're experimenting with these tools in various contexts are looking for clarity um, on that difference. Um, and I guess this is, this is not directly related to copyright law, but also is, I think, important to bring up. Um, at least in the music industry, there are a lot of works that happen to be generated um, with tools that have an AI element that um, have been taken down. Um, and the kind of public narrative around that is because of copyright infringement, but actually um, the underlying issue is more around streaming fraud 
in that case, it's around kind of bots trying to, uh, some bots trying to like drive consumption around specific songs. Um, and so that's definitely, especially from like a research perspective, that's, that's a fear that I have a lot of the time is just conflating very different issues. Um, that is a, a different legal issue, but not related to IP um, per se. So just kind of, yeah, clarifying, um, uh, yeah, a lot of terminology has to be clarified and also like exactly if, if something is taken down, um, what exactly is the reasoning for that and kind of not completing um, those reasons. Thank you so much. And as a follow up, um, how is everyone thinking about substantial similarity, uh, the substantial similarity test actually, when evaluating AI generated content? And if you didn't answer the previous question, please feel free to answer this one too, if you have any input. And I see, Sherry, that you have your hand up, so I will pass the floor to you. Um, cool, yeah, I, I think I addressed this in my previous response, so I'll keep it brief. Um, or in a previous response around attribution um, and why, especially with like larger language models, the ones that ingest the most data, or sorry, like larger diffusion models also, that ingest the most data and also have the most users. Um, um, attribution is, is so messy um, and already, um, again, like speaking specifically for music, but there are, like so many examples of artists um, that already sound very um, similar to each other. And even taking AI out of the picture, um, current IP law in the US, current copyright law is very, very messy in terms of like how to deal with those instances. Um, and Sherry, just in case, just because of the interference, if you wouldn't mind repeating the last couple seconds of what you said for the record. Yeah, yeah, no problem. Um, I think just, yeah, to sum up, uh, not even taking AI into, um, not even taking AI into account, at least I know on the on the music side, uh, current IP law is super messy in terms of how to deal with um, two works that like may happen to be um, really similar. Uh, a specific case is a Blurred Lines case from several years ago. And I know that there was a lot of um, debate around like whether the outcome of that um, really should have been what it was. Um, and I know fair use was mentioned in the previous panel quite a bit as, um, very longstanding, but also very messy concept that people are like still looking for uh, clarity on. So I definitely see that being part of this, like, I guess, ongoing search for clarity around um, AI and copyright in particular. Thank you, Sherry, and apologies for that uh, interference, but we'll move on okay. to AJ next. It's a very good question. I had to sit and think about it for a second. Um, I think when it comes down to the similarity, substantial similarity, it, it ultimately depends on the data set that was used. Um, because it does influence the weights and how to create the image. The weights do not store any images, so it's not sharing images without consent, but it is trained on a data set. And if the data set contains images that were not part of the consent, you know, given to the data set, then that's something that I think does not pass substantial similarity, which maybe it's a fifth prong that should be added. It's, you know, it's very new territory, but I think whenever it comes to a copyright claim with generate with the output, and we're trying to figure out malicious intent, then the person who has the weights has to show either where the weights came from. And if they made their own weights, they have to share their training data, their data set. If they cannot do that, or they can show, or they've shown that the data set, you know, has copyrighted material that does not have written consent, then I think we've got a problem here. Um, so I think just trace it back to the source. What is the training data? And they have to provide the training data when it comes to, you know, the striking similarity. Thank you very much. And Kristen? I will agree on that. And it becomes a lot clearer if you understand, um, you know, what the inputs were used to the output and how similar they might be. Uh, it's a little bit harder when, again, the proof um, of a requirement um, is, you know, saying that where something came from, if we've got those ties, if we have those strings back to understanding what those inputs were to that output, um, becomes a little clearer and a little bit more easier. Um, on its own, it's got a lot of subjectivity and I think it's it's hard I think it might be a good basis um but again it's going to be a lot harder and a lot more complex um as it has so many different potentials to be able to clearly draw a line um from one to the other if we don't know um those inputs um that were used and there's not attribution there thank you very much and Hillary I merely wanted to build on what other folks have said in the sense that what these models are doing is taking a very large amount of data and building essentially a compressed representation of inferred features in that data. And then we draw from that distribution 
uh, using a bunch of ways to pull different things from the distribution. So in a sense, the model is trying to create the average representation of the data, then biased by whatever prompt or input it's given. And so this seems like a question of whether we're looking specifically at the outputs as an independent artifact that could have been produced by any means, or whether we are looking at the entire production process and where the different inputs into that process come from. Thank you very much, and I will pass it to Gabby. Thank you, Melinda, and this will be the last question for session two. What additional registration policy guidance, if any, would you like to see the office provide with respect to the registration of works that incorporate AI-created elements? In particular, how should the office handle audiovisual works that incorporate a mix of AI and human-generated materials? Let's start with AJ. Thank you. A big thing for me is um, if someone has a legitimate claim for copyright of the weights, they cannot claim copyright on the output that an artist uses. I think those are separate. Very much like if Apple has copyright on the hardware, they do not own the copyright of the material I make using their hardware. Someone who creates the paintbrush doesn't own the art I make with the paintbrush. And I think that's where the dividing line should be. Thank you. Kristen? I believe that our emphasis needs to be a lot, at least right now, um, within the training models, um, as that will really help dictate what can be used with the outputs. And so if we do kind of uh, the heavy lifting in the work within defining um, and procuring consent and attribution within training models, then that all gets a little clearer in terms of the outputs and how we're able to associate things back from those outputs. And so if we focus on getting that lock set and determining what is required, when it comes to being able to copyright those, uh, those outputs, we've got that understanding of all of the kind of ingredients that went into the creation of that recipe and the rights and the, uh, the ethical guidelines that were used to be able to facilitate it. And then um, it becomes really just a factor of how we give attribution um, and what this looks like if it's a new form of, of copyright or beyond, um, as it takes into account all of those um, individual agreements, as well as you know the new recipe that was created um, by the sum of the prompts um, and the model and everything in between. Thank you. John? Speaking on behalf of the nearly 12,000 writers who are out on picket lines today, um, I just want to make sure that any guidance that the that this um, this process yields um, re always remembers the human being behind the creative work that's being output. Um, that we make sure that we're not just thinking about the copyright holder, but the actual creator of the work um, as being a person who needs to be protected in this process. So often we talk about inputs and models and outputs, um, but we forget the fact that there was a person uh, who was doing that work and make sure that we're always uh, emphasizing the role of that human being who is there and not just the uh, statistical models that generated uh, this output. Thank you, John and Kylan. Yeah, so I think it's interesting because I think there's multiple things here that are actually creation. So if we look at the training data, the model, the prompt, and then the actual output, each one of those things could have independent creators, each of which could be covered by different copyrights. There's lots of, you know, there's, there's a lot of standard licenses around training data that may you allow, may allow commercial or non-commercial usage, but it's on the person who has acquired and, and prepared that training data to set those licenses and for others to basically then be accorded to them. Similarly, on the models, if you had a research group, for example, develop a new model, you know, you have LAMA, which came out of Stanford. You also have closed models, which are by large companies. They obviously have the rights to ownership of those models and the usage of them and can basically, you know, and, and should be at, well, attributed or paid accordingly. Next, you have prompts, which is the inputs. So in, in an image case, you have a text input. Um, most often, you may have another image as an input. Uh, in our system, for example, you have a variety of different controls that the, the creator puts in, and they are owners of those controls. So basically, these are sort of the parameters that they put in in the same way that if you took a Word document and you typed in it, you own what's in that Word document, even though you don't own the like Microsoft Word or Google Docs, for example. And then on the output as well, someone has created that. Um, one thing that is I find interesting about the conversation is it sometimes is as if the model is in autonomously producing output. In all cases that I have ever seen, there's always a human who is using that tool to produce the output. 
And in that case, it's no different than a painter using a paintbrush. They still own, they, they are the owner of the outcome, regardless of whether it was processed through an AI tool or whatever. You know, the model itself is still owned in the same way that Google Docs or Microsoft Word is still owned by Google or Microsoft. The, you know, the actual training data is the same as in the same way that, you know, the backend code of Python or, or JavaScript is owned by the, you know, the groups that manage those. But the production, the actual Word document, as in, in the same way that an image is produced by an AI model or a character in our case or a dialogue or animations are all owned by the person who has actually actually produced those. And so you think about a case of an a, a, a artist, you know, using a mid journey or stable diffusion to produce an image, the artist owns that, of course, it, it should really I see no difference in, in, the, in the case of, you know, them using a paintbrush, it's just a modern paintbrush really. Um, and then in the same cases, you know, if someone created a really amazing prompt that other folks could use or, or build abstractions on top of, they should own the basic configurations there. And similarly, the companies that build the technology that actually powers that in the same way as we've done with, you know, internet, like we're on, we're on a Zoom call, Zoom doesn't own the content of what we're producing right now. Um, but we we are ultimately still using the tool and they have the, you know, they, they have the copyright and the, the rights to that. And so I think at each part of those, it's important to consider who the actual creator is and providing them the ultimate attribution. Uh, and, and I think it's, it's key that those are distinct because very likely in this ecosystem that is evolving in the same way as any creative process, there will be different creators of each parts of the, the, the process. But at the end of the day, if you have a creator using a Photoshop, that creator still owns the image that's coming out of that, not Adobe. Um, and I think this is a very similar case. Thank you. Can we hear from Hillary next? Thank you. I wanted to build on what's been said before and what Kylan said as well. And just to say that as the Copyright Office considers what we may do here to keep in mind that whatever rules and norms are decided on, they apply not just to applying AI technology in systems and workflows that already exist as a productivity tool used by a human creator, but also in the space where we are currently inventing experiences where the production is happening at the moment it's being consumed. And that whatever we decide on as a copyright community should apply equally in all of those situations, which are in fact uh, very different and some of them are just emerging now. So it's fun. Thank you. Thank you. And now Sherry. Uh, yes, very quickly just to build off of um, um, Kylan, uh, what Kylan and Hillary also just said. Um, I think in also, I guess speaking with deeper knowledge of music specifically and the role that technology has played um, in in many ways to you know richer and better effect for like music creation. Um, the yeah the notion of determining whether someone should uh, be eligible to own a piece of IP, um, the notion of that being determined by the tool being used to make that work, I think is um, a very that could set a very dangerous precedent. Um, I'll give a music example and give a very recent example more of the visual world like if you know when if if digital synthesizers when they first came out if you made a piece of music using that um instead of an analog instrument that automatically disqualified you um to own copyright in a given work i think there's there's potential concern about that precedent being set with some cases in the us for example around this is not audio visual but with um the recent uh kind of comic book case that's kind of gone through the us government um i if I, yeah, I believe the, the stance was that um, because uh, mid journey was being used, uh, you know, as a tool that alone disqualified the images from being copyrighted. Every, every other part of the book was eligible though. Um, I think that kind of bifurcation again, yeah, it's very, very dangerous has not really happened um, any other time in US history, legal creative history. So I wanted to bring that up. Um, uh, and then, so that said, I think there are also, uh, we're seeing other, um, governments already take uh, steps in either direction on being open or not to, um, like, uh, to, I guess, have any creative data be used in training for these models. That's definitely an area where I know a lot of people in music and, and audiovisual industries at large, they're, they're just looking for, yeah, guidance and clarity. And um, also, it's not just artists, it's um, founders, like, you know, developers who also want to um, uh, build these tools for those artists as well. Thank you, Sherry. And before we wrap up on this question, Kimberly, would you like to offer any input? Uh, no, not right now. Thank you. 
Thank you. And Tara, I would like to offer the same opportunity to you. Would you like to um, offer any input on this question? No, everything I feel has already been said. Thank you. Thank you both for your thoughts um, on the registration. Thank you all for your thoughts on the registration policy guidance and for sharing your input today. Melinda, I would like to turn it over to you. Sure, thank you everyone. So we're coming to the close of our panel. We have about three minutes left and this may take us a minute or two over, but we just wanted to extend um, everyone and invite those who are interested, especially those who we may not have heard as much from today to make a brief closing statement. And just, as I said, in the interest of time, if you could please keep it to about 30 seconds. Thank you very much. All right, John, go ahead. Um, a lot of people on this call are representing corporations or artists individually. And I think I'm the only person who's representing, uh, DJ is also representing a guild of uh, union members who are all able to enact, to act collectively on something. So, so many of these issues are gonna need to be figured out in copyright law, and that's what the purpose of this is here today. Um, but the decisions that are made here will also ripple back to the kinds of um, work that we're doing as people who do work for hire. And so I just wanna say that this is you know, not just a down the road issue for us. This is the reason we are out on strike. One of the reasons we're out on strike today um, is that many of these issues will be resolved on the federal level, but some of them will be resolved at the negotiating table, which is really the appropriate place for us to be tackling some of these issues uh, collectively and with our employers. Thank you. Thank you, and AJ? I just wanted to say I actually wholly agree with John that at the end of the day, it, this is involving people and artists and individuals, and we shouldn't forget that within the entire process. I know we're using terms like data sets and weights and diffusion models, but at the end of the day, it's people, and let's keep that in mind as we're moving forward. And Kristen, go ahead. This is a tremendously exciting period to be alive. Um, as a creative who works in the space and has for many years, there's not often a lot of technological advancements when it comes to creativity. There's been in tools in the past, but this is really a tremendous place uh, in time to be. Um, and with it, I think it comes with a whole heck of a lot of responsibility. Um, we have the opportunity to set things out with a good set of guidelines and rules that is really going to ensure that we protect art and creativity and we foster it um, and we allow it to be amplified and grow and leverage this as a tool um, to create in ways that we never have been able to create before. So I think it has a, a tremendous potential. We've seen the potential already um, and I'm so appreciative of the Copyright Office listening to all of us to be able to put forth sets of rules and guidelines that are really going to allow us to further creation as we continue to support our creative um, communities. Thank you. All right, thank you so much. And oh, go ahead, Tara. Thank you. I just wanted to touch upon what AJ and John also said. Although we are moving into a more AI world, I do think that based on a lot of studies that we've done as a company, the, the human voice is still the forefront and a lot of people still prefer the human voice. So just keep that in mind when you're creating these new copyright rules because AI definitely does not create does not replace a human voice or a human. Thank you. And we haven't heard from uh, Sherry, Hillary, Kylan, or Kimberly. So if you would please like to give closing statements, like I said, uh, please keep them to 30 seconds. And I apologize that we've gone a little bit over, but we want to give everyone the chance to give closing statements. All right, go ahead, Hillary. Thank you. I just wanted to say thank you to our hosts at the Copyright Office and to everyone for participating and to echo as well that AI offers us the, we're just at the moment where we can start to invent what we want to do with the technology and how we can use it as a tool for creative experience in a bunch of different ways. And it is a really exciting moment for all of us who are building in this space. And I hope that what comes out of this is a community of people who are building precedent, deciding what that vocabulary should be and having rules that allow us to do this in a way that is fair, supportive of those individuals and brings access to more people. And so thank you. Thank you. And Kylan, go ahead. Yeah. Um, so the one, the one thing I would love to say is 
I think there's a lot of different ways that AI will be used in the future. Um, as I mentioned before, there's, I think, a big focus on how this specifically empowers creatives. And I hope that the way that the Copyright Office approaches this is with that in mind, and that also that companies thinking about this focus on how they extend the capacities of creatives versus, for example, allowing consumers to, you know, just generate a lot more content, because I think that ultimately that that is where a lot of the value lies in, in the creative process is, you know, taking that creative vision, extending that, and then pairing that with, with, you know, next generation technologies to ultimately move experiences and content and media forward. Um, and so I know that this is how we're really thinking about it as like a new extended paintbrush for creatives and designing our entire IP protections and everything for our users around that. Um, and I think that it will go a long way for creatives to feel comfortable as well using these tools, knowing that they maintain ownership over that over that content, um, but also that companies have a good guidelines and um, in actually how to approach this so that they know how to make sure that the creatives maintain their ownership and feel empowered to use these as tools and not feel like they're um, a competing, uh, you know, a, com a competing option for the creative process itself. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Sherry? Um, yeah, just a few uh, closing statements. And yeah, thanks again for, for having all of us. Um, one to, yeah, to reiterate like the human centric aspect. Um, I think there's in the media, there's a lot of conversation about like AI replacing humans, AI, you know, yeah, replacing us in our work. Um, that uh, I guess AI, at least for now, um, is not like fully autonomous like that. Usually if it's, if AI is like replacing some human, it's, there's also a human behind it and there's human intent behind it. So we are, you know, yeah, talking about like humans interacting with, um, interacting with each other. So I definitely just wanted to, in terms of like how we talk about this technology, um, definitely uh, there's still humans at the helm. It's not AI just like acting by itself in kind of a um, macro, you know, economic context. Um, and then uh, secondly, yeah, this is less a uh, sense of policy, but more about like uh, culture. I think what's great about this conversation and I think what will help drive better policy is definitely um, uh, creating a culture of, um, again, yeah, artists and developers and founders kind of starting that conversation proactively about how they can work together um, much earlier in the process instead of being um, purely reactive to, you know, tech companies and founders kind of just, you know, running, uh, running with whatever tool or model that they're, they're working with. Um, the current uh, AI moment actually strikes me as like, being much leaning much more into that culture compared to um, kind of earlier movements in the history of music and tech and media. So I'm very excited about that and um, glad we're all doing that. I would just encourage that more um, as these policies develop. Thank you. Thank you. And then Kimberly, would you like to close this out uh, on behalf of DGA? Uh, sure, briefly. Uh, well, thank you for organizing this panel. Um, you know, this is all just a very new area. Our priority is to protect filmmakers. But you know, we we caution and should be prudent not to make any sort of mistakes when thinking about new legislation or policy or guidelines. Thank you again for your time. Thank you. Uh, this concludes our second segment. We will take a very short uh, five minute break and return for the final segment. Right, welcome back everyone. My name is Joanna Blatchley. I'm an attorney advisor in our office of the general counsel, and we will begin our final session shortly. For those of you who are just joining us, a few Zoom keeping, uh, Zoom upkeeping, housekeeping uh, announcements before we get started. Uh, if you are joining this session, but not for this particular session, please keep your camera off and your mic on mute. Uh, we are recording today's session and the recording will be available on our website. Uh, the transcription function has also been activated. Uh, in this session, we will ask each of our speakers to give brief remarks on the subject of artificial intelligence and visual art. Each person will be limited to two minutes, and the moderators will be watching the time. We will call on the speakers in the order listed on the agenda. So, uh, Ryan, could you begin? Well, thank you to the Copyright Office for inviting me to speak today and for its public engagement on this important topic. I think the framing of AI as just a tool is misleading. Of course, AI is a tool in the sense that it only completes tasks people ask it to complete, hopefully, and in the sense that it was made by people, although AI can code reasonably well now, but at some level, we're starting with something made by a person. 
Although that person may be many people spread over time and space with no way of attributing an AI behavior to a specific person. But AI is not a tool like a pencil is a tool in that it can partially or entirely automate the generation of a creative work. The activity that used to make a person an author is now in some cases being done entirely by an AI and now being done on a widespread level with a growing variety of systems that are publicly available online and in some cases free of charge. Of course, right now, AI is largely being used to augment human creativity and the generation of a new work involves a mix of human and AI activity. But sometimes everything traditionally creative is being done by the AI. In asking where to draw the line, this of course could be a very difficult activity, but it is one that courts are experienced doing where multiple people have conflicting authorship claims. I think the Zari of the Dawn decision was consistent with the Copyright Office's human authorship policy, but it shows both the procedural and substantive problems with that policy. Procedurally, the office wants applicants to disclose the role of AI, but at the risk of threatening their own registrations. I submit that many applicants are likely not to be sufficiently knowledgeable about this requirement and not to be fully candid. But the bigger problem isn't with the office asking for transparency. It's with the requirements itself, which is based on dicta from 19th century case law. People, 20th century, 19th century. People should not have to be concerned that the use of AI in the creative process is going to render AI output unprotectable. This would directly contradict the purpose of the Copyright Act, which the Supreme Court has repeatedly held is to benefit the American public by promoting the generation and dissemination of creative works. Allowing the protection of AI-generated works as the United Kingdom does, for instance, would encourage the use and development of creative AI systems that would result in more public benefit. And it would likewise encourage the distribution of AI-generated works. Nowhere in the Copyright Act does it state that there is a human authorship requirement and corporate authorship has been a fixture of US copyright law for more than a century. I would thus urge the office to reconsider its human authorship policy to help ensure that the United States stays at the forefront of the creative industries and AI development. Thank you. Thank you. And next we have Juan. Oh, can you hear me? Oh, sorry. Hello. Thank you. Uh, so my, from my point of view as a freelancer, and I've heard people uh, pointing this out as well, this is not about the creation helping the creativity. This is an economical problem that we're going to be facing uh, since the, there will be a devaluation all across the board of the creative industry. So it will be a complex problem if copyright doesn't is not held specifically by people just generating or painting, not generating, painting, or creating their own images. The, the, if you generate an image and you don't have any human input after that, that'll be devastating for a lot of freelancers, for instance. So I pledge to the Copyright Office for, uh, to please have that into consideration. Uh, there will be a, a substantial devaluation for every freelancer all across the world, even though this is a very US generated problem. So thank you very much. Thank you. Next we have Alex. Hi there. My name is Alex Cox. I am a writer and a film director. Among the films that I've made are Repo Man, Sid and Nancy, Walker, uh, Tombstone Rashomon. I want to talk about a film that I made in 1983, which is called Repo Man. I am the original author of the screenplay. Uh, the screenplay reverts, has reverted to me, so I am the copyright holder of the screenplay in the US. The film is under copyright by Universal Pictures. In preparation for this panel, I have to defend the University of Colorado to use his AI system and to see if it could produce for me an outline of a screenplay called Repo Man on Mars. And the AI system did so. He sent it to me. It was, uh, where do I begin with the breaches of copyright? Which breaches of copyright should I talk about first? The theft of the plot, the scenes, individual sequences, even the character names were reused by the AI system. And this wasn't some rinky dink little system. This was Chat GPT-4, which is owned by a company called OpenAI. 
OpenAI is 49% owned by Microsoft, 49% owned by a number of uh, institutional um, oligarchs, including Elon Musk. So when my copyright material... Looks like we may have lost um, Alex. So Alex, are you back? Alex, we'll can give you one. Can you see me now? Yes, Am we I can back? hear you. Oh, you I are. was cut off. How, how strange. Where was I? Oh, I was talking about how... Uh, OpenAI uh, is a company, a multi-billion dollar company owned partially by um, Bill Gates and Microsoft and partially by Elon Musk. And when OpenAI scraped the internet, as they put it, to educate their AI system, they didn't just hoover up my film, they accessed masses of copyright material, non-fiction works, pieces of music, works of art, all were hoovered up by OpenAI, and all are being now offered for profit um, via this company. This couldn't have been done, this breach of copyright couldn't have been done without the massive scraping of the internet. Um, it wasn't done for fair use because it was done for a commercial purpose. Therefore, Microsoft, Musk and their colleagues broke the law. Um, the AI companies have engaged in a massive copyright theft and I'm just looking at a tiny corner of it. So what John August of the Writers Guild said is entirely true. If AI isn't reined in, and if copyright theft via AI isn't prevented, writers are going to be reduced to technicians who attempt to fix the, uh, the copyright violations which AI has produced in any particular work. The only solution to this problem is to re-scrape the internet and remove all copyright material from the database to which AI has access. And in closing, I would say that earlier on, one of the first speakers today said that Quentin Tarantino and Francis Coppola were heroes of Hollywood because apparently they encouraged plagiarism. They did no such thing. Coppola and, um, and uh, Quentin Tarantino have become wealthy and successful film directors thanks to their talents, but also thanks to the copyright regime, which has protected them and their films. This is what the Writers Guild are fighting for. This is what I'm asking you to fight for, because let's face it, the big media companies, the studios, the record companies, the streaming companies, the big six publishers are all in bed with these, with these artificial intelligence companies anyway. So we look to you as creative people, as artists, we look to you, the US Copyright Office, to safeguard our copyrights. Thank you very much. Thank you. And next we have Munir. Hello, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Munir Ibrahim. I'm the executive vice president of Trupic. Uh, Trupic is a technology company based in Southern California, and we are focused on digital content transparency and authenticity. We've long been concerned about the ease of which our sensory reality can be deceived through things called cheap fakes, which are rudimentary changes to images and videos, then deep fakes, uh, which is the obviously synthesis of videos and images. And of course, the now uh, explosion and proliferation of generative AI tools, which create synthetic uh, images, videos, and digital content. Um, there's a growing industry of transparency and authenticity and that's the reason I'm speaking here today. We firmly believe that adding transparency and authenticity to digital content will have significant value when it comes to issues related to copyright attribution and ownership. We are a proud founding member of the Coalition for Content Provenance and Authenticity, the C2PA. That is the world's first standards body that created an open standard for transparency and authenticity in digital content. This is not hyperbole. This is an existing standard. It is on the 1.3 version and it is being used in a variety of areas today. One of the most notable is Adobe Firefly and the Adobe suite of products. This open standard can be added to any generative AI output. Last month, Trupic released the world's first transparent deepfake. 
with Rebel AI in Amsterdam and Nina Schick in London. This is an example, a model on how attribution and a tamper evident seal could be added to generative AI outputs that give attribution and ownership to the people who created it, give the option not to train on those outputs to those creators, and also perhaps most importantly, give transparency to content consumers uh, so that they know that the output that they are looking at or the content they are looking at has or was created by generative AI. This will be an incredibly useful feature as we have this discussion today in future discussions. When we can think about how we can mark things, uh, mark training data, uh, you could do that in the 1.3 spec so that it is not actually trained on by uh, those platforms that adopt the standard. And we can help creators attribute and mark their content. And I already noted the transparency, which is incredibly important for the protection of our informational ecosystem. I would encourage the Copyright Office to engage with the Coalition for Content Provenance and Authenticity. There are a variety of ways in which they can engage and uh, learn more about the standard and how it can be applied. I also encourage the folks on this call to look into this open standards body in which anybody can join and it can you can join at a completely free level under the, the Linux Foundation. So uh, I hope this is helpful and I look forward to further discussion. Over. Thank you. And next we have Eduardo. Okay, my name uh, is Eduardo Salazar. I'm the CEO of Fortis Agir, which is a Swiss based company, a technology company. And uh, uh, in the same way at Munir, we are working on technology to effectively um, provide transparency and, um, you know, um, provide creative uh, people choice, the choice of whether their content can be uh, freely used or not. I've been taking a lot of notes throughout the, uh, the uh, panel today, and as it has been debated, uh, it's very clear that AI and copyright protections in audiovisual works have a very intricate relationship. Um, all of us are very much aware that AI can generate original or derivative works uh, independently, which raise questions about whether copyright should be attributed to the AI system, to the content creator, uh, or to the person or organization that deploy the AI model. Also, as it was debated today, uh, determining fair use um, is another big challenge, simply because of all of the nuances influencing fair use, such as the purpose and characters of, it, of use, uh, the nature of the copyrighted work, uh, the amount and substantiality of the content used, and uh, ultimately its market impact. So, on the one part, uh, it's quite clear that AI systems provide a great tool for audiovisual creators and not just in terms of productivity, which is perhaps the most promoted, most talented benefit. Um, on the other, it's also plainly uh, evident that such benefits come with issues that must be adequately addressed. And I'll try to be quick. Firstly, those uh, around liability for copyright infringement uh, is essential, uh, I believe, to strike the right balance between robust protection and undue restriction on user rights. Secondly, the accessibility to AI generated work, uh, particularly in education, research, and cultural preservation, which was not that much talked about today, uh, and the use of copyright material in such productions. Once again, a balance should be struck uh, between protecting copyright and enabling the broad dissemination and use of knowledge, uh, the promotion of creativity and of innovation. It is also key that companies deploying AI systems are fully transparent uh, about the source of the content used for training such systems, uh, how these systems operate, uh, how decisions are made, and how to address errors or disputes. And finally, uh, perhaps the most obvious and yet most neglected aspect um, is um, how to ensure that original content creators are able to choose how their content is managed by those developing or using AI systems, and depending on the content's choice, whether uh, the access to a fair compensation for any work used in such models is uh, made. 
thank you very much for coming. Thank you. And our last speaker for this panel, Stephen. Hi, I'm Stephen James Taylor. I'm a TV film composer, concert composer, and sometimes filmmaker. And um, I feel that one of the good things about the emergence of generative AI is that um, uh, AI is that it's forcing us to define what it means to be human. Um, what's the difference on one hand between uh, like like Gen AI rapidly gathering relevant data and parsing it into an audio or visual product, and on the other hand, the organic processing of the same data set through years of emotional life experience. Can, AI, can an AI algorithm help us as artists to convey deep feelings? The answer is yes, but uh, just like existing technologies do now, but will it soon be able to bypass the entire arduous life experience process and just create the whole thing for us? Um, if yes, how do we evaluate the artistic worth uh, and ownership issues? Um, I'm also a member of the music branch of the Motion Picture Academy, and recently there was a discussion uh, among some of the members about, you know, anticipating the day when there would be an AI score generated for a, for a film. Would, would that be disqualified? So th there's a continuum of something that's fully automated and then something that's done by hand with talent and, and training. And then there's stuff in between where you're using the AI for certain tasks. And it's, it's a very gray area as to, as to how you evaluate uh, wh where to draw those lines. Um, uh, and and uh, an example of a gray uh, area, that, that's just one example of a, of a, of a gray area. Um, uh, so overall, my, my take is this, is that human artists, as human artists, our judgment calls are largely physiological. Um, uh, our bodies tell us when something's, quote, right. Um, with AI, remove the physio and just keep the logical. All mind, no body. Uh, AI algorithms don't have adrenal glands um, to get excited when a new, a great idea emerges. Um, yet it has already shown the ability to produce viable works of audio and visual art. So in conclusion, I have basically three questions that I do not have the answers to. Um, because one thing we can count on is that uh, there will be unforeseen consequences of this, both really good and really bad. So um, the, the three questions are, in all of this discussion about AI, what is it we're assuming? Two, what are we leaving out? And three, what is it we really want from it? Uh, and I think we each need to determine where we stand on these as the sand is already shifting beneath our, our feet. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you to all of the speakers on this session. And with that, I'm going to turn it back to Emily for closing remarks. Thank you to all of our speakers, our listening listeners, and our moderators today. This has been an interesting and in engaging conversation, and we at the Copyright Office appreciate the perspectives that each of you has shared. Um, we will consider them as we continue our initiative to examine copyright law and policy issues raised by artificial intelligence technology. Our next and final listening session focuses on music and sound recordings and will be held on Wednesday, May 31st, 2023. You can find more details about this session and our broader AI initiative on our website at copyright dot gov backslash AI. The office will be providing additional opportunities for those interested in artificial intelligence to share your perspectives with us. That concludes our listening session, and we look forward to hearing from you in the future. Thank you.